Well, good afternoon. I'm speaking from Glimpses Coffee House in Fairfield. And today we've got Dean Gotcher speaking on the dialectic. And uh, we want to just welcome everybody here. Thank you. Well, for anyone who's uh, heard this before, you know I have a lot of material to cover. I'm accused of giving people a drink out of a fire hydrant. Um, the handout I've given you um, is on my website, authorityresearch.com. There, there are four note section. Um, this is the last one. And on page three, halfway down, the first page and a half is scripture, or I guess you would say two and a half pages. And then on page three, halfway down, I start a lot of the quotes I won't have time to cover today, but you have them in hand for leisure reading afterwards. Um, so I used to use PowerPoint, but it slowed me down. It take me 15 minutes to explain one sentence, so I can just cover a lot more material this way, and you can read the quotes and sort of try to figure them out yourself. Um, I'm going to talk about a process that I've called diaprax. It's a combination of two words, the dialectic process. and uh, the practice of it, or the Greek word praxis. Nothing wrong with the word. It's The uh, Bible says, lie not one to another, seeing you've put off your old man with his deeds. The Greek word is praxis. So there's an old man praxis, which is lying, and there's a new man praxis, which is proclaiming the truth. And uh, what I want to talk about today is what we call a paradigm, or a way of thinking, uh, Isaiah 55, uh, I think verses 8 and 9. God says, My ways are not your ways, neither your thoughts my thoughts. As far as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Uh, in other words, uh, God's paradigm, God's way of thinking, is not our paradigm, our way of thinking. And I want to compare and contrast these two different ways of thinking because that's essential to understanding the dialectical process. The first part uh, I need to look at, or we need to look at, is found in Scripture, and that's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Uh, that's not dialectic. Actually, it gives us an indication of dialectical thought, but uh, it's didactic. Uh, it starts with, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now the issue is trust. Uh, I was talking to a friend today about trust because a traditional way of thinking, a way of thinking, I call it a system of righteousness, and we'll get into that. Uh, Romans 8 uh, talks about, well, excuse me, Hebrews uh, 12. Uh, the scriptures reveal to us that chastening produces a peaceful fruit of righteousness. So the key to righteousness, or the system, not just righteousness, but a system, and we don't think this way, but I want to explain this. The system of righteousness has at least four uh, ingredients. Faith, belief, obedience, and chastening. Because when you have faith in the, the dad or the higher authority, you can believe that what he's told you is true, and you can obey. And sometimes we don't obey, so that is why we have chastening. It just brings you back to the obedience structure. But uh, that's the issue of trust. Uh, and so trust is in that, in the faith aspect. But the Bible said, uh, cursed is the man who trusts in man. So the issue is, who do we trust in? We are to take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. And it's not just Christ, it's obedience. It's a system. It's a, it's a way he behaved. He said, what my father commands, that's what I do. And then he's given us the same system. Uh, not that God is a system, we can try to systemize God, but we will limit him to our human understanding and uh, it won't be a true definition of God because God is spirit and is not flesh. But uh, we, we he, Jesus said also, were to, um, he who does my father's will in heaven is my brother, my sister, my mother. So there's a top-down system in the Bible. It's called a patriarchal paradigm or a uh, patriarchal way of thinking, which is there's dad, the husband is to rule, desire the heart of the wife is to the husband, children obey their parents, and there's a clause in there, in the Lord. So everyone is accountable to God. 
the husband, the wife, and the child. But there is this top-down system, this patriarchal system. And it is, as Hebrews says, that our, heavenly, our earthly fathers chasten us for their own good pleasure. Uh, different than God, he still chastens, same system, but he chastens because he's holy and he's doing it for righteousness sake. Uh, so it's not just here and now that God does chastening. Whereas our earthly fathers would simply do it for here and now in this life. Uh, so trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now the, the heart is where the problem lies. Because the whole New World Order system is built on the heart of man. But the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. And it's desperately wicked. You're never deceived because somebody lied to you. You're deceived because you trusted them. See, we are to take, even take, don't trust me. Take every thought, who, whatever anybody shares with you, take that captive to the obedience of Christ. In other words, weigh it before the Word of God. Does it line up? If it doesn't line up, then it has to be uh, you know, disregarded or uh, brought subject to the Word of God. Then, in all your, lean not to your own understanding, and that is where we find the dialectic kicking in. That's Genesis 3, 1 through 6. And I'll get into that a little later. It's simply the event that took place where Satan came before the woman in the garden. Eve was deceived. Adam wasn't. He just abdicated. He knew what he was doing. But, but Eve was deceived into participation in the dialectical process. Now, I took a lot of philosophy classes on the dialectic, but I never had any scripture, even in a Christian university, a uh, Christian professor ever take me to the Word of God in a study of the dialectic. And yet, it is throughout scripture. Uh, Second Timothy, uh, through, uh, I can't remember, but Paul in Second Timothy talks about um, we're, we're to take every, excuse me, um, so-called science, yeah. There, there's a, the verse that deals with uh, pseudonomous gnosis. In other words, there is a false science and there is true science. And the dialectic is a false science. It's treated as a scientific method. And it's the same thing as what happened in the garden. You'll see that Eve follows a very scientific process. But by science ties you to the material world. And so by her reasoning through a scientific paradigm, a materialistic paradigm, she negated a righteous paradigm and changed the way she thought. In fact, the result was God says, having eyes they cannot see and ears they cannot hear. That, that they could not comprehend God's righteousness because they had set themselves as being righteous. And this is where the Bible says there's a way that seemeth to be right. That's theoretical. We think today everything's an opinion. See, there's a way that seemeth to be right, but the end thereof is the ways of death. So that, that we'll get into the Genesis 3, 1 through 6 uh, paradigm. If we look at it, well, a little bit about myself. I earned a teacher's degree back in 1971 in the dialectical process in, in this uh, diaprax. I didn't know that's what I was learning. Um, I, uh, I had been raised in a home where my mom taught uh, from the 20s through the 50s. She taught a form of education known as traditional. We were introduced to transformational, or a different form of education. Uh, I went to college just thinking I was going to learn the way my mom was instructed, and I'm sure my parents thought the same thing. Uh, but we were introduced to this material. Every certified teacher in your community, this is across this nation and around the world, uh, is structured on applying these books or the works from these books. They're referred to as Bloom's Taxonomies. Uh, to be certified, this is your material on how to develop the curriculum in the classroom, how the environment of the classroom is to be shaped. And that directly affects the outcome of the class. In other words, how the children will think. The first book in Taxonomy of Education Object is Book 1, Cognitive Domain, 1956. Uh, cognition is simply knowledge. What is knowledge? Uh, how do you acquire it? What's of worth? What is not of worth as far as uh, the use of knowledge? The second book came out in 1964, Taxonomy of Educational Objectives, Book 2, Effective or Feelings Domain. Now, I was raised in a traditional home where the cognition was actually separated from the affection. In other words, feelings did not determine what's right and wrong. My parents determined, like in the garden, God determined what's right and wrong. Uh, and so my parents might have, you know, they said, take the garbage out. Now, I might have 
uh, felt like I didn't have to take it out, so I would say, well, I don't feel like taking the garbage out. And my parents would take care of my feelings because I was accountable to a higher authority. But in the classroom, when the effective domain came in, in the, in the 50s, actually the effective domain was incorporated in the first book, but the, the process would not have been accepted if it was blatantly uh, brought into the classroom. The result was when the effective domain became just as important as the cognitive, the classroom changed. It was no longer a teacher up front imparting facts and truth. It was now the teacher becoming a partner in the discovering of knowledge with the students. Uh, a, a partnership that changed the structure of how the children thought in the classroom as well as the teachers. And so you had to train the teachers on how to apply this method of change in the classroom. Well, um, the result of that is if effective domain is now property, it's as, as, as much of worth as anything that you learn as far as facts, you take your child to the restaurant and you're teaching them to eat with a fork and they decide they're going to challenge your authority and they reach into the spaghetti with their hand and you pull their hand away and they reach again and then you are teaching them to be accountable to higher authority to learn the facts and you chasten them and they cry now it is somebody's duty probably everybody's duty if you're in this dialectical structure of thought to turn you in because you damaged their property because feelings are now property somebody can come by your property uh, you might have some junk cars because you need the parts later on. You, you, you're just thinking down the road, I better keep this. But they, they don't feel good because they're looking on your property. So it's their duty to change the laws so that uh, your property must make them feel good when they go by. Same thing with cutting trees or anything that you do. Everything has to be effective domain, no longer just cognitive. So reality was changed from truth to relativism because feelings are relative, they're changeable, they're situational. And so we, we certainly have experienced the effect of these books, uh, being this material being applied in the classroom. Well, by my, my, when I went to college, I had faith in the Lord. I believed in the Word of God. Uh, I'd given my life to the Lord. And, but as I uh, progressed in my academic training, I found that I could change the Word of God. Because we can do that. We can change the Word of God from facts, this is the truth, to where it's our opinion or somebody else's opinion. And so I learned the language of the dialectical process, which is, well, I feel or I think. And by doing that, then I could feel better about myself. And I could be less offensive to others. And uh, that was certainly where the focus of education was. It's feelings, it's human relationship. But by my senior year, I was living in sin and rebellion. I was miserable. I only had one verse left that bothered me, and that was remember your first love. I wanted to have the love and the joy and the peace I had with the Lord before I got involved in all this academia. Uh, so one evening, I took the Word of God, put it on one side of a coffee table, and the books of my profession put them on the other side, and I sat what turned out to be four hours trying to bring the two together. My mom taught, and she had faith. I must have missed that class 432. You know, take that class that would connect my academic training with my uh, desire to uh, have this love and joy and peace that I had in the past with the Lord. But I came to realize that I couldn't do that. I had to choose one or the other. And the reason for that was I had to accept the fact that I did not have the capability of going into the Word of God and changing it. I had to go into the Word of God and let it change me. I had to accept it as is. And when I did, I knew I had to repent of my sin and my rebellion. And when I did that, his love and joy and peace came back into my life. But then I realized I was damaged goods. I couldn't use the process I was trained in because not only would it affect me, it would affect every child who came into the classroom. Now, the difference with the way my mom taught the environment of the classroom, because the taxonomies are all about environment control, or they call it climate control, uh, was she had the Ten Commandments on the public schoolhouse walls when she taught. She could read scriptures to her students in the public classroom. In fact, the scriptures are in the public textbooks. And she could pray with her students in the public classroom. And she could 
spank her students in the public classroom. When I went to college, that was all gone. Everything had changed from a traditional structure, a traditional environment. Uh, then I decided, well, I'll go into seminary. Uh, that's a good place to get my head straightened out. I, I knew my heart was right with the Lord, and I enjoyed uh, the studying the Greek and, and studying the Scriptures, but ran into the very same process I'd run into in college. Didn't really know what it was, I just knew something was wrong. Uh, didn't finish, I was almost completing, and then halfway through the semester, it was so full of this stuff that there was just no reason to pursue it any further. Uh, and I left, I decided to go into a profession then that doesn't mess with your head, I went into construction. No such thing as a board stretcher. You cut the board short, it's your fault. The old saying, measure twice, cut once. Very facts-based world. Ended up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, raising my family, running a business. And then I had a chance in my later 30s to go to a major Christian university there. Stayed away from education, still didn't have this all figured out. Stayed away from theology, uh, didn't want to get into that either because I saw it there. Uh, and I focused on my heart's desire, which was to understand uh, philosophy and European history. I had some really good professors, one had earned his doctor's degree on how Hitler had taken the minds of the youth in Germany and restructured them for his own purpose. I took every Russian, German, and European history a class he, uh, he, he taught. Uh, another professor earned his doctor's degree on the uh, French Revolution. We're literally living the principles of the French Revolution. When you know the details of those events and you look at the pol political scene uh, for, for several decades, you see uh, us following that same procedure. It's literally a Bible to the, the left uh, in, in the, the restructuring of America, reinventing America. Then I took a law class under John Whitehead. He's argued cases before the Supreme Court. He insisted that we go to the source. We end up reading 1,600 pages of Supreme Court decisions. Uh, we studied the framing of the Constitution, read the minutes, uh, did a lot of research. One thing in the class, he kept insisting that we go to the source. Don't read material secondhand. And uh, that was very important. We, we started reading the documents in the 50s. Our courts started saying, well, we don't know what those framers meant. Well, that's like a lawyer reading your will saying, well, I really don't know what he meant here. Well, there's mischief a brew if you ever hear that coming out of the lawyer's mouth, and that certainly was coming out of our court's uh, writings, and their intent was not to go back to what the framers meant because they were in, uh, had an agenda to restructure this nation on a new way of thinking. Then uh, I, the last class I took was from a professor who earned his doctor's degree out of Harvard. I did several that had earned their degree from Harvard, but his was unique in that he actually earned it in communist Yugoslavia. I had a chance to study the Soviet form of government, Tito's form, unique amongst all the other satellite countries. I studied the Politburo system, uh, enjoyed this intellectual challenge, went back to construction full time. You know, when you're putting shingles on a roof, you don't turn to the guy next to you and talk about eminentizing the eschaton. You know, it's just, just a lot of, uh, you know, an interesting and, and helpful as far as I was concerned just to me, information. Then a little over 20 years ago, Goals 2000 came on the scene. I watched TV for a couple of weeks and started talking to it. I don't know if you ever talked to your TV. I kept saying we can't be this stupid. This was everything I had learned that had destroyed other nations and yet here we were fully embracing it. Now Bill Spady is a PR man for Goals 2000. He mentioned four men that were foundational to his thought. Benjamin Bloom, John Carroll, James Coleman, and James Block. Well, I didn't remember the last three, but I knew Benjamin Bloom. There again, every certified teacher, even today, in your community, all across this nation, everywhere I go, is structured on this material. So the Lord sent me back to the university, this time not for a class or a grade, but to go to the resource, uh, uh, to the source. And so I pulled these taxonomies, these books, off the racks and began to do the book chase. Um, on page six in the first book, he says, this is a taxonomy, or uh, briefly, a taxonomy is simply mapping. You know, you, 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 you taxonomize in your kitchen, you taxonomize. You put, you know, you make sure you put uh, the white items, you don't taxonomize color-wise, you know, salt here and sugar there, and, and so you organize your environment so that you can more easily uh, make or change things. And same thing with rocks and plants and animals. Uh, it's a key to producing, to production. But this is a taxonomy of the way you think. And uh, that, that all of a sudden changes who you are. Your, what, what, why are you here? And what's your uh, reason for, for breathing, taking your next breath? 
Uh, and so on page 6, he says this is a taxonomy of psychology. Well, that's illegal. But I guess who bothers to read books? Because in, when you begin to read this material, which you don't read, by the way, in college, you only read the back part, and that's the application, how to apply the curriculum. As you, the first part is written in the language of social psychology. It, you know, maybe your master's level, you're going to start to understand the language. Doctorate, you know, you're going to be steeped in it if you've pursued this far. May not still understand what it is. It's just you know your profession. It's your future. Well, as uh, I progressed, and he also mentions that it was current psychological methods, and that's important to understand because uh, there was a psychological process or a way of thinking psychology that had uh, become key to the change in the nation from the 30s on. Well, on page 32, Bloom says, we recognize the point of view that truth and knowledge is only relative and that there are no lasting truths for all times and all places. Well, he was, he was, not, you know, he was very uh, factual in citing sources, but he didn't cite this source uh, because a famous philosopher, he simply paraphrased. The philosopher said, in the eyes of the dialectical process, nothing is established for all times, nothing is absolute or sacred. His name was Karl Marx. And as I pursued this, I came to realize that I had earned my teacher's degree back in 1971 from a Christian college on a Marxist curriculum system. As every certified teacher in your community has to sit in classes in college and learn to apply. Does that mean teachers like it? No. I have teachers come to the meetings all the time. Halfway through, they're usually in tears because they now understand why they're the butt of everybody's jokes. They go into teacher's lounge and nobody talks to them. They talk about them. Uh, they're trying to teach facts in a classroom and the students come through into their classroom from the feely-feely classes and stare them through the wall. Uh, it is living hell for teachers out there in the public arena and even the Christian schools because the same thing's going on. Same process. If you have accredited Christian school, it is accredited because it is using Bloom's taxonomies. Even homeschooling here in California, they're requiring the homeschool parents to uh, become certified. They're going to be certified on Bloom's taxonomies. And therefore, see, truth and knowledge is only relative and there are no lasting truths for all times and all places. And it's going to have a direct effect upon how the parents are to create an environment in their child's learning experience. All for the sake of change. Well, the second book, I began reading it, and on page 54, he says what we call good teaching, and he puts that in quotes because we really don't know what's good, everything's relative, is achieving effective objectives, or attaining effective objects. In other words, how do we uh, create an environment where the children's feelings can come out in the classroom? Through, he says, challenging the students' fixed beliefs. Well, who gave those children those fixed beliefs and who gave educators the right to create an environment where they could feel free, the, parent, the teachers and the students, in challenging those fixed beliefs and getting them to discuss issues? And so the issues became social. They were no longer issues of right and wrong. They were issues of human relationship. The word human, by the way, isn't found in the Bible. Hume is of the earth. Uh, human is simply earthiness. It is not, there is no soul. Uh, and you study psychology, study the soul. No, it's a redefining of what the soul is because even Freud never understood what the soul was. He wasn't interested in the soul as in regards to what the Bible uh, describes the soul. Well, then on page 91, Bloom says, the effective domain is in retrospect, in other words, if we stop to think about it, a virtual, quote-unquote, Pandora's box. Now, Pandora's box is a Greek, uh, Greek mythological story about a person who received a gift. Uh, but they were told they could never open it. Now, that's awful. I mean, somebody give you a gift and say you can't open it, how long would you last? A day? A week? A month? A year? Ten years? You know, maybe, maybe, you know, today's it. You're not going to be around tomorrow, so I'll finally open it. The problem is, once you open it, you can't close it, and what comes out of it is evil. He's talking about the heart of man. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. There are three passages in Scripture that talks about out of the heart of man proceedeth, and I call it the shopping list of iniquity. And we certainly have seen what's happened to our culture because we allowed Pandora's box to be opened in the classroom. Um, then on page 83, 
84, yeah, 83, he writes, The significant thing to remember in this very ambitious project is that the major impact of the new program, and by the way, it is a major project. The Manhattan Project developed the atomic bomb does not compare to how much is invested in this project. He says, is the major impact of this new program is develop attitudes and values toward learning which are not shared by the parents. Then he says, there are many stories of the conflict and tension that these new practices are producing between parents and children. And as you begin reading the structure of social psychology as material, the only agenda is to destroy the traditional home. There is no other purpose for reading this material and applying it in the classroom. Then on page 166, he gives us uh, two names. He uses the German word Weltanschauung, in other words, our worldview or our paradigm, our way of thinking. And of course, he's saying that because he wants every child to come out of the classroom with his way of thinking. And at the bottom, he gives us two names, Theodore Adorno, as an example of his way of thinking, and Eric Fromm. Adorno's book, The Authoritarian Personality, you read UN material, and he is so popular, even though the book was published in the 50s and he's passed away a long time ago, uh, his material is relevant for making decisions uh, all around the world through the UN. And so here is a Marxist. I'll give you a little history about these guys. Uh, and then Fromm, his book, Escape from Freedom. That book was all about Germany because of the Protestant Reformation, had a very strong top-down system of thought. In fact, the scripture said, call no man father. And so you found the counter to the Catholic Church through Protestantism, the priesthood of all believers. You and I are personally accountable before God. So that circumvents the king. Of course, Luther had a little problem with that because for him to stay alive, he had to sort of bring the church under the state. And that was carried over even into the colonies. It wasn't until Roger Williams came here and promoted the freedom of the conscience. In other words, on the day of judgment, the state, the community, nobody has input. It's personal between you and God. And so your behavior here is shaped by that way of thinking. And that was the freedom of the conscience. And we get that the Declaration of Independence would never have come from any religious organization on the face of the earth. Because every religious organization would have used the state to maintain control over the citizens. See, and so when actually it goes back to when God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, that was freedom of the conscience. In other words, I give you the freedom to choose me or the world. And uh, so it, it, it supersedes institutions. Because there's always a problem with an institution. Even when you start an institution for good, eventually the institution itself becomes the instrument of good. And you will compromise your original intent to keep the institution going. Uh, and so you must always make every institution, every uh, activity that we do, continually going back to the Word of God and weighing, uh, weighing its, uh, its what it's doing. Uh, from what, is this what the Lord wants us to be doing? The history of the Frankfurt School, because that's who Adorno and Fromm were from. And, and by the way, the authoritarian personality, uh, Adorno's book, was all, who was the authoritarian personality? It's Jesus who said, what my Father commands, that's what I do. It's Jesus who said, he who does my Father's will in heaven is my brother, sister, mother. That's an authoritarian personality. Now, if you're into education, you have studied Maslow and his hierarchy of felt needs. I've read his material, I've read his journals. Uh, in Maslow and Management, he says, the first thing I do with authoritarians, in other words, anybody who believes like Jesus, is I break their backs immediately. I treat them like the bastards they are. So you find a very caustic spirit that moves behind this material. A contempt for the authority of God, for God himself and his authority and his word. And you're seeing this, unfortunately, even in the church today. And I'll explain that a little bit. So the institute was started back in 1911 when George Lukács and Karl Korsch Two famous Marxists. You may have never heard of them before, but these are these are they'll, they'll have statues probably someday in this nation in regards to these guys. Uh, George Lukács uh, uh, and, and Karl Korsch. Karl Korsch came to the United States eventually in in the 30s. Didn't do a whole lot. He worked with Kurt Lewin on a couple projects. Uh, George Lukács stayed in Russia. He had to recant his works because he wanted to stay alive under Stalin. 
but his, his early works were key. What they did was they went to the Communist International with a new form of Marxism. Now, the traditional Marxists, because there's traditional and transformational, the Frankfurt School were transformational. Remember, we went to the Soviet Union. We went to rescue a Marxist. The U.S. went to rescue a Marxist from Marxism, Gorbachev. The communists were out to kill their own. Well, it was the traditional communists who hate the transformational communists or Marxists. And so there's a, I'm going to explain the difference here today because we're going to look at systems or ways of thinking, which Bloom's taxonomies uh, brought into the classroom. The, uh, the new change, uh, or this change in Marxism, had to deal with Sigmund Freud. The Frankfurt School said, well, Freud and Marx think, think the same way. They're both dialectic. So what we'll do, instead of just accepting your uh, returning of Marx, in other words, you come in and say, well, Marx said this, therefore I believe it. That's the old belief, faith, obedience, chastening system. Well, the system stays in place. We want to get rid of that system. So it's not so much that you study Marx, it's you are Marx. You become Marx. You experience Marx. And so you have to practice, praxis, the dialectical process. It's not to love to learn it philosophically or be able to recant little stories or lecture. It is everybody in the room must practice it and that's where Sigmund Freud came in. Because Freud dealt with the individual, Marx dealt with society. So what the traditional Marxists were simply doing is you'd come in here and say this is right and that's not according to Marxism. Uh, and you would be accepted but if you came in here and said this is mine and not yours as far as personal, they'd shoot you. Uh, the problem with that is that after a while the lights went out. And you go, I think we just shot the last guy at the power plant. Does anybody else know how to keep the thing going? And see these uh, Marxists, they understood where this was going to go. You're going to shoot your infrastructure. So we don't have to shoot the infrastructure. We simply bring in psychology and we get people to willingly participate in the way they think and the way they feel and the way they act. Well, the traditional Marxist said, you're nuts. You know, you can't have a revolution without bullets and blood. What are you going to do? Put people on couches and ask them how they feel and think? And uh, yeah, you know, and so they were kicked out. It's uh, unfortunate that they didn't shoot them, but it would have blessed us. But instead, they went to Thuringia, Germany, started the Institute of Social Research, then ended up in Frankfurt, Germany. Until 1933, there were 21 of these Marxists. The year Hitler became chancellor, uh, they skedaddled, and most of those guys came to the United States of America. In fact, Kurt Lewin, who edited their paper, he was never a member of the Frankfurt School, but he edited their works. They were very jealous about who had touched any of their material, so he was certainly on, in the same ideology. He came from Berlin, went to Iowa City, heartland of America, in 1933. He's the father of group dynamics. Anytime you're in a group, others in the room are affecting you. Do they like me? Do they not like me? And so there's this uh, dynamics that takes place and I can use that if I'm a facilitator to get people to change the way they think. And so he was key to understanding group dynamics, how to unfreeze you, how to move you, how to refreeze you. Uh, his material is even quoted today in training manuals uh, in the federal government and state government. Uh, very, and then there was J.L. Moreno, who came from uh, Vienna, Austria in 1927, the father of role-playing. Uh, role-playing is very important because in role-playing you exclude any transcendent voice. Everything is sensuous. Everything is from you, material. It, it, there is no spirit whatsoever other than the spirit of the relationship of the people in the room. And, and Moreno writes about this, who shall survive? Uh, a new religion, he calls it. A religion where Jesus, even coming into the church with this process, Jesus will eventually wither away uh, because of the relationship that people have with one another. So he, he did his writings and uh, J. Uh, uh, Rockefeller used his material in the Tennessee Valley Authority. Didn't work very well because everybody knew Fred knew how to work the power plant. So, you know, you, but you had the team talk. You had to start somewhere and that's... Uh, uh, that's how this stuff was introduced in its level, way beyond John Dewey, because John Dewey was just philosophical. And you could, you could, you could pick up quite uh, rapidly what teacher was traditional and which ones weren't, and you could fire them. This came in with a totally different uh, sort of a, a cloak, where very difficult to see it. Uh, you could sense something was wrong. Everybody, like I, in college, knew something was wrong, discernment. 
is God's PhD to you. But it doesn't give you the answer. It just says something's wrong. Now, it's up to you to go search it out. See, And, and as a believer, we go to the Word of God. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not where Christians were going. They were going to men. You know, people's opinions. Instead of searching a word and allowing the Holy Spirit to direct you, it really reveals where this nation was in the 50s. It really wasn't any longer in love with the word. It wasn't in love with God. It was in love with the experience of the church and the fellowship and the, the feelings that came from the community. Well, uh, so we have, I've talked about Adorno, uh, Fromm. There was Paul Lazarsfeld. He went to Columbia. He was the professor for James Coleman. James Coleman earned his doctor's degree under Paul Lazarsfeld. James Coleman is the man our Supreme Court turned to for advice on education. Then there was uh, Herbert Marcuse. He went down to San Diego. He wrote a book uh, in the late 50s, Eros and Civilization, all explaining how Freud and Marx uh, were synthesized. In fact, uh, he wrote one of the two Bibles of the 60s. Uh, that book, Eros and Civilization, Bill Clinton's Bible, uh, if you want to understand how the universities were ch so quickly changed, it was because anybody who was left in mindset uh, read that material and fully embraced it and then applied it in the classroom and in academics and in how eventually how the universities were structured. And we saw certainly in the 60s this stuff explode all across this nation. The other book, uh, Norman O'Brown, Life Against Death, uh, another writer dealing with the same thing, the synthesizing of Freud and Marx. Uh, Eros and Civilization took me half a year to get through the book. It's not that thick, it's just that every, every five pages you had to get away. Blood pressure would be up to here. And uh, it was very difficult reading. I sort of protect myself. I did PowerPoint slides. You know, every time I... There's a quote. It's very important. I really don't want to dig into this because this is depraved material. And so I would just, you know, how you can distance yourself, just put it on a PowerPoint slide. And halfway through, I had over 400 uh, quotes. Uh, so I certainly can't even begin to cover the material just to give you an understanding of this is what is going on. And I share this in part, maybe foolishly, that somebody might torment themselves and go research more. What happened uh, with this material, in the back part of Bloom's taxonomy, there are 40 authors. And I thought maybe two or three weeks at the university, read a few books and, you know, get that... Oh, that one quote. Isn't everybody working for one statement you could just share with everybody and the lights would come on? Well, I, th I thought that same thing. And so I started looking for it. And uh, so I read these guys' books, 40 of these authors. And then I read their authors, or you know, their bibliography, and then who influenced them. And it took me, while you were having a life, I was telling myself to get a life. I spent five years at the university reading over 600 social psychology books. Now, I couldn't tell anybody I was doing it. Because every, everybody would say, Quit tormenting yourself. But the Lord sent me. And I would come home grieving. Because in your spirit, it's just grievous, grievous to see what had not only happened to me, but what young men that I knew in college just saw in half a semester. Godly young men become flaming Marxists in, in just no time at all. And saw what this had happened. And understood now what was going on. And not only that, but seeing what was happening to the very country I was living in. And what even happened to my parents? Because my mom came home in 1957. She loved teaching. But she threw her books in a chair and she said, that commie diddy school, I can no longer discipline these children. And she quit a profession she loved because the environment had changed. She could no longer uh, be comfortable in the compromise that was going on around her. Um, so, it, you know, a lot of research. What happened in, in this regard as far as doing the research? I would come home, one escape from the, the stuff, because I have boxes of notes at home. I would just set the, you know, sometimes 20 books on a desk, just pulling them off the racks, just reading as fast as I could, trying to understand the dialectic, uh, its real meaning, because you get, you know, a superficial meaning, all, learn all the terms, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, and all these guys, but you really never get the spiritual, what, because it somehow it just, it, the spiritual, the, re, the righteousness part is just dropped off. Nobody addresses it. Um, and I would come home, want sleep. You know, isn't sleep a wonderful thing? That's a great escape. And so here the Lord was having me read all this stuff. I didn't want to read it. I just knew that, you know, I ever have just, you, this is what you're to do, and you do it. And then he'd wake me up in the middle of the night. And at first I thought, how rude, you know. Here I am doing this, and you won't even let me sleep. That's my escape. But what he would do is he'd put scripture 
He waked me up with a verse. And it was like, it was one of those wow moments. And I go, oh, I remember that. This is so profound, I'll remember it in the morning. I wouldn't remember. So not only would he wake me up, I had to drag myself out of bed and write it down. You know? And I learned from that, God's not addressing the problems out there. He's addressing the problems in here. He's getting us to be obedient to him. And whatever, because we want to solve the problems out here so we can keep doing what we want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the problem isn't the leadership. The problem is us. See, God's looking at your heart and my heart to determine what to do with this nation. He's never been hung up on this nation. See, one of the early words uh, that was used in America was the word providence. You know, providence of God. It's not used today. Because we're not crying out to God because, see, somebody's come along and said, oh, I'll give you this, I'll give you that. Government will give you whatever, you know. And we trust and so there's no real crying out to God because we're getting some of our needs bad, knowing wh where this thing's going. It's, it's, it's uh, pretty depraved where we're going as a, as a culture. Well, the, uh, uh, over a period of time then, uh, came to understand what the dialectic was. And it was really when the Lord revealed Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Uh, that pattern, that, that system that Satan used on the woman in the garden, she wasn't called Eve yet, but the woman in the garden is the very same pattern of the dialectical process. Uh, so let's look at the taxonomy itself, uh, the mapping. Uh, in the dialectic, the words, Hegel, by the way, most noted for the dialectic, it was around before him, as you can see, it was in, I'll get to it again, the scriptures, but he made it academic. He made it where it was uh, a part of the politics and the way of thinking of culture. And he didn't use these words. Fichte did, and those followed did. Thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And uh, you, what it is, thesis is simply a position. You write a thesis paper, it's a position. And what the teacher is doing if they're just teaching you a thesis position is they're wanting you to have an attitude. And that attitude is knowing. I know. Well, how do you know? Well, I went to the math book. I went to the science book. And you're quoting another source. In other words, your knowing doesn't come from you. Because that'd be a theory. Knowing comes from somebody who, uh, something external to you. It's greater than you. It's higher than you. And so you're always being accountable. Your justification of your position is always above you. It's a top-down system. So if you had written a thesis paper or position paper here for me today, and you didn't have your sources, your, your quant quantity, because you know, that really has taken a beating. Now it's quality, which is feelings. It's not quantity. Because when you know the truth, all you do is just accumulate evidence to support the truth. Well, there is no lasting truth, so why are you accumulating all this evidence? You know, all us, all us conservatives, if you want to call it that, because you have to be careful. A Marxist can be eventually conservative, and anybody who's coming in with the gospel can be a liberal. So that that's just depends on the situation. But but those who are thinking right and wrong, we, we carry. We used to, I used to carry these boxes around. See, because you think, well, if they hear a few facts, I can give them more. And you know, they're not interested in facts. You know, they glaze over in about you know, five minutes if you can keep them on board. Uh, because they're interested in something else. And that is, uh, the, the, we're in a culture now that goes, I feel and I think. See, it's, and so that's an opinion. And as long as you share an opinion, they'll listen. But when you start presenting facts and truth, then you lose them somewhere. So in, in a traditional setting, if you went, I feel and I think, I would chasten you. You can never have a position on how you feel or think. I get you in a town hall meeting. You come to defend the law that protects your property. But I don't, you might quote the law, but I have enough people to want things different. And of course, they have an opinion on how things should be. And all I'll ask you is, well, how do you feel and what do you think? The answers are in the question. So if I shape the question, how do you feel? Or what do you think? And you respond, well, I feel this or I think that. There's no position. There is no property in your opinion. You lose just by answering the question. It's loaded. And so these facilitators are skilled in coming into your community, into the classroom, into the workplace.
space everywhere into the hospitals, HMO, school to work, political, uh, transformational outcome based education in the workplace, to, uh, or transformational quality leadership for the military, you know, just everywhere you want to go. Cops, community order policing, 100,000 policemen, Bill Clinton was talking about. They all go in. I have a friend who's a detective with the San Diego Police Force, just constantly going into these, these meetings. Just, you know, if you have hair here, pulling it out. <laughs> you're, you're fortunate. <laughs> you don't have to pull it out anymore. It's just irritating. It's aggravating. And you're trying to get sanity in the room, uh, but people aren't listening. So, because we've left from knowing, because knowing is rigid, it's not changeable, it's set in its way. But that's traditional education. You're giving that generation, the next generation, a position to hold to. And so there was stability in society. Well, you can't change the world in stability. You have to destabilize. Bloom says in the back part of the first book, Ta Taxonomy of Educational Objectives, book on cognitive domain, this will destabilize the students in the classroom. Well, now to get you over to synthesis, because that's the dialectical process. Uh, just briefly here, this is tradition. Not in the tradition of the elders' sense, because that would certainly be over here. It's tradition, as the Apostle Paul said, I've shared the gospel. Stay to the tradition. Keep proclaiming the truth that you've heard. Don't move from the thesis, the position, because now you know. And uh, that is an attitude, by the way. Jesus had an attitude. He spoke with authority. You look at Scripture, they were all amazed. This guy speaks with authority. He speaks as a knower. Not a I thinker or I feeler. See, it's, it's all, and all the scribes and Pharisees were opinions I think and I feel. And after Pentecost, before Pentecost, the disciples were all I feel and I think. After Pentecost, they spoke with authority. Something changed in the way they thought and the way they acted. So, the tradition, now I want to get you over to transformation. Not transform from one position to another, that's biblical, but the process of transformation itself, which is change. Heard the word change recently? It's all about change. And uh, so, but tradition or thesis and transformation or synthesis cannot communicate. They're just, they're too separate from one another. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that uh, this synthesis has to justify something. It doesn't justify position. There's no justification in a position. So you're not justified in a meeting. When you come in with the truth, uh, you, you're gonna, the, the meeting has to be destabilized. So there's no support for you. It's like coming in a room with no floor. You, you, you can't walk on the floor that you would be able to use to justify your position. The reason for that is, in the dialectic, it has to deal with not just thinking, but feeling. Feelings, remember the effective domain, was key. Now, the third book that was published, R.H. Dave and others out of the UN, uh, The Psychomotor. That's the biological, the nervous system. Because the belief is, we're going to evolve to a higher state as we practice, praxis, the dialectical process. Serious. So the issue was not to justify position because then that would always get in the way of feelings. The issue was to justify relationship. And we've all experienced that. You have a position, you know what's right, you know what's wrong, your friend's going to do what's wrong tomorrow, and so you have the night to think about how you're going to share it with them. Well, when you know the truth, the truth is liberating. Have you ever found that? That's true. It's just liberating. And it's really short. You don't have to go into a great big long dissertation explaining truth. It's just right there. This is right and that's wrong. But you don't go to sleep right away because you think you would. You know, and tomorrow you're going to share the truth. Your friends should be all excited because they're going to hear. No, no guarantee about that. You, you share the truth and tomorrow they might say, you know what? I don't like you. You hurt my feelings. 
I'm going to hurt your feelings. You go your way and I go my way. And so all of a sudden you realize feelings are now important in your life. So the night before, you're going to cut and paste and rearrange the truth for the sake of the relationship. You're going to justify the relationship with your friend is now important than any truth that God has given you. Now we can do this in a Bible study. We know all kinds of different translations, but where's the source of the translation? I want to get into this too. Because really, what is the Word of God? And if I can create works that are not the Word of God, but they will force you, if you hold one position, to butt heads with somebody else with another position, and then for the sake of unity, we will put aside our differences. Why would you put aside the Word of God for a relationship with somebody else? For the sake of the relationship. And we can justify, well, if I keep the relationship, then I can eventually share the Word of God. No, you already see the word a witness we are not here to be successful. God has never in His Word said, you're going to be successful. You're going to be a witness. The Greek word witness is martyrius. You can't get martyred if you don't keep holding to a position. If you're moving all over the place for the sake of relationship, you're going to destroy your witness, your position that God has given you. So it's easy for us, they call it a paradigm shift. It's not, it's a paradigm change to a paradigm of shiftiness. And we can be very shifty. We can say, well, I'm doing this for the Lord. Well, are you? When you set aside the Word of God, you're not doing it for the Lord because what did Jesus say? First temptation, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth from the mouth of God. He is the only one who justifies our next breath. It's for His glory, not for our glory. not for Because our glory is always vain. What can I get out of this for me? So the focus is now today of thinking about feelings. I guarantee every one of us here has even today thought about our feelings or somebody else's feelings. And it's, it's such a big part of our life. And I'm not saying that we, we shouldn't do that. It's just that when you know the truth, what are you going to do with the truth? See, it's, again, it's liberating. I have friends that have learned the truth is liberating. I've learned the truth is liberating. It'll liberate you from promotion, next term in office, respect with your relatives. You know, it, it will cost you today to know the truth and proclaim the truth. That's why people glaze over because I call it willed ignorance. You know, ignorance is bliss. Don't share the truth because then when I know the truth, then I'm going to be accountable and I go to go out and share and I already see how you're being treated and I don't want to be treated the same way. So we move from tradition to transformation through transition. You see, in the traditional home, this middle zone was under control of the facts. It's biblical structure. But once the feelings became equal with the facts, then you could move to the third stage. And that's reasoning. We moved, if you study philosophy, we moved from consciousness. Because you're just conscious here. You're aware. You're obeying. That's, that's the thing of life. To self consciousness. Now you're aware of your feelings, which always butts heads with consciousness. And the third part is reasoning. All of philosophy, see, Kant's critique of pure reasoning. Kant had a problem is that he still thought faith was important. This is faith over here. And so he had reasoning over here. Uh, he said, well, he elevated reasoning up equal with faith and didn't destroy his faith. No, he destroyed faith. But he just wouldn't do it. He wouldn't go any further. And then Hegel came along and said, okay, we can synthesize reason and faith. And so he still had a spirit. And Marx come along and says, there is no spirit. It's just reasoning. So you have to transcend the spirit out there who's guiding us. We make history. Marx says, we control the media. You read what we give in the paper. You talk today about what we give you to talk about in the paper, on TV, on the radio, and you create our history because we have excluded that which would support the past. And so you're caught up in this wave, this surge of change. So now the language is the key. Traditional languages is and not. Uh, two plus two is four cannot be any other number. The UN, their tensions that caused war, 1950, Harry Stack Sullivan, he said the one word that's caused all the world wars, and I had to read this over, it's too simple. 
You know how you read something that's so simple, you say, it can't be that simple. Is the word not. What did God put in the garden? There was no problem in the garden until God said, you can't. There's no problem in the home until the parent says, you can't. And so this, this is restraint. This is traditional. The parent tells the child, you can't go out. Now we have stress. Because the stress in life isn't the knowing. Say you know the truth and share it with somebody else. And if you don't like them, or they're not your boss, or somebody who you know, can affect your life, you can just say, you know what? You're wrong and I'm right. And they can go their way and you go your way. No problem. But we like people. We, we, have, you know, we have people we depend on. And now there's where the stress comes. Because if, if we, God said it's not good that man be alone. So we need relationship. He's not countering this. It's just that is our relationship with one another more important than him? Is our relationship with this world more important than our relationship with him? And that's been, what's, you know, that's been the butting of heads from the garden on. You have to make the decision. Choose today who you will serve. So the, the, the language is key to this. God created the world with words. Bloom says that they had to create a language of communication between uh, the educators and the testers. Whoever develops the test, see, has to be the educator. So if the test went state and national and international, the local teachers don't design the test. That's why the teachers have to oversee those tests, make sure nobody in the public sees those tests, and protect the powers that be from the local community changing the language of those texts. See, that's copyright. And uh, so state assessment test. Just think about it. Assessment. Who determines the worth of a building? It's an opinion. So somebody has an opinion of your child's worth. And somebody can punish your child on an opinion. That's what a state assessment test does. Well, certainly, you would like to know what that opinion is, so you could say yay or nay, but you can't. Because those are protected by state and federal law. Even the teachers can't see those tests. And by the students, Adorno says, just by answering the questions, remember the answers and questions? Just by, they would give students surveys. Just by answering the survey, it would change whoever was reading it. So by taking these tests, it actually changes the way the children think as they're taking it. And I've read them. Uh, it certainly does. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, this was a state a test for before the homeschoolers in Oklahoma could drive, take the test, you know, take the driver's class. They had to have a reading proficiency test. And everybody thought, well, that's good. That was Bill Clinton. You know, we, uh, the kids need to pass this test so that we know that they can read signs and whatever else, you know. And uh, so it was all supported. Well, I had a chance to look at the local one, not the because the state one, um, I... I I wanted to look at I, I actually got in the room and uh, I asked the lady who was presenting, I said, okay, if I have to sign a sheet saying that I would not reveal what was on the test, that you had to sign a sheet responding to my five questions. And so when I handed her my question, because she handed me the sheet to sign, I handed her my sheet, because she, she said, okay, you can ask me questions, not in the room, but by a letter. I said, okay, now you sign this because that way, you know, I know you, you got this letter. She wouldn't sign it. In fact, she flipped it back, and on the news the next week, she says, we will leave no fingerprint. Well, isn't it interesting? She flipped that back to me. And I said, you will sign this, because if I want to see the test, I have to sign. You sign this, that these questions you're going to be asked. Is this uh, what this test... It wasn't personal to the test. It was what was the intent of the test. She sent up an armed guard to escort me out of the room. And I felt sorry for the guy. Because he was doing his duty. He was shaking. I mean, I, I thought, man, I must be a terrorist. There's this guy, he was, had his hand on his gun, and he was just shaking like that, like I was going to hurt him. And I apologized to him. I'm sorry I put you under the stress. All I wanted to do was know the facts. So you see how important this is. But the first test, I can tell you, a girl is out swinging um, and enjoying the flowers and the air and the birds 
You know, all the senses, touch, taste, sight, smell, sound, maybe not taste, but she's enjoying the day. And then the mother comes out on this landing and she says, come in now. And, and then goes back in the house. The rest of the story, the girl continues to swing. As I was reading that, I cringed. Then the four questions dealt with the air, the butterflies, the birds, the sounds. No recognition of the parent or any authority. That child was changed. All 20 questions were like that. Taking the test changes the children. Because it negates the knot. It negates the parental structure. It negates a godly structure. Because I call these systems, system of righteousness. Which is Hebrews 12. In fact, God says, if you reject chastening, you're a bastard. Because my children are, you know, God calls us children until the day we die. Why? Because we act like children. And he, he has to reprove and correct and rebuke us uh, to bring us back into right relationship, to do what's right. But this system here, because its feelings, is sensuousness. And that, that's uh, Romans 8. Paul says, I do that which I don't want to do, and I don't do that which I want to do. Who can deliver me from this body of death? So with my mind, I love the law of God, but then I have this law of the flesh that leads me to sin. And so it's called a belief-action dichotomy. I have belief, and yet I, I do a dichotomy. I don't behave according to my belief. And his answer is Jesus Christ. Because, see, God says, be ye perfect as I'm perfect. That's a requirement. And if you think this through, the first thing you have to say in the morning is, God, I can't do it. And you know what God would say? You get an A for the day. Absolutely. You can't do it. But I can. See, He receives the glory. Not me. If I could do what God wants me to do, at the end of the day, I could say, God, look what I did for you. Remember those who come to him and say, Lord, Lord, look at all we did. Wonderful things in your name. And what's his response? Depart from me, you worker in iniquity, because I didn't know you. How does he know you? You say, I can't do it. What, what was the law all about? The law, you can't be saved by the law. The law is God's definition of him. If you can fulfill the law, you're God. It simply was to say, you're not God. In fact, all the law can say is, you're wicked. I have a new understanding of everybody. We're wicked. Well, that's good news because Jesus came for the wicked. He didn't come for the righteous. If you can fulfill... And just remember, the scribes and Pharisees put themselves in Moses' seat to love the praise of the men. But he said, you hate the law. Now, if you had done exactly what God wanted you to do, you'd look at those laws and say, man, I'm wicked. I need somebody to save me. And you'd have been looking for me. Here he comes... But instead, you hated the law, you changed the law, you humanized the law, you redefined the law so you could feel righteous in yourself. And so here I come, who is righteousness? Because it's, this is what Luther understood. He was reading scripture and it said, righteousness is imputed. I can't earn it. There's nothing. The best I've ever done in my life, the best I'll ever do in my life, in the past, in the future, even today, is as a stinking rag. I can never do what's pleasing to God. It's what He does. See, the Father sends the Son. Isn't it interesting? Jesus didn't come because He loved you and me. He came because He loved the Father. Now, I'm not saying He didn't love us, but He came because He loved the Father. Look at the night before the cross. Let this cup pass from me. That's feelings. But then He says, Nevertheless, thy will be done. Because the Father, you see, our love is always very vain. What can I get out of this for me? But God's love is, He looks at us, a stinking rag, and He says, I love you. I, I love you so much, I'm going to send my son, and he's going to obey me. He loves me so much, I can tell him whatever to do, and he'll go do it. And I'm sending him to die for you, to take your stench in his place. That's how much the Father loves. Notice the top-down, it's the Father's love. 
The, the, the prodigal son is not about the prodigal son. He went home because he could get a shower and go to bed and have a meal. It's the father's love. See, Bloom's taxonomy was the destruction of the father figure. There's no support for a father figure in our, in our nation anymore. I was just recently looking at the Brazilian. He, the education system, by the way, is following Paulo Freire's material out of Brazil. He died in the, in the mid-50s. Uh, but he was a, uh, the oppressed oppressor syndrome. In fact, he says anyone who prevents a child from natural inquiry in other words, your child just chasing their feelings, and you prevent them, you chasing them, that's a violent act. That's where we're going. So when you chasing your child in that restaurant, that's a violent act. See, our culture is changing, the laws are changing, because the courts are now the ones who are making the law. And they're making the law according to the dialectical process. Because now it's sensuousness. There's a system of sensuousness. As, as this would be Hebrews. And uh, Hebrews 12. And this would be Romans 7 and 8. And then now we have a system. Uh, this is what happened in the garden. Now this does not happen naturally. You need a facilitator. Satan was the first facilitator. He was the first counselor. He was the first therapist. According to Freud... If you hold to standards here, but you have natural inclination to do this here, you're neurotic. And so you're always going to be neurotic. You need somebody to come deliver you from this traditional way of thinking so you can be your own person. Discover your full potential. So let's look at this human nature. Oh, this system here is deceitfulness and manipulation. That's science and technology. Well, you can't deceive rocks and plants and animals because they don't have sensuousness. You know, animals have sensuousness, but you can manipulate them, but you don't deceive them because they don't have history. They can't think of the past and the future. They're just learning from their history is just their life experience. But with man, you ha if you're going to treat him like science, you have to deceive him. See, if you, behavioral science is a science. It has to be material. So somebody has to convince you, you're just material. And then you're manipulatable. And that's what these books are all about. There are no lasting truths, so all of a sudden the only truth that we have is sensuous-based, which is always changing. And therefore I have to create an environment where I can then move you through sensuousness and manipulate you to a new world order. What's the new world order? The old world order was top down. The new world order is a French Revolution. Fraternity, equality, liberty. See, liberty is different than our liberty. In America, talk to Vilcame wrote Democracy in America. He never understood this nation. Because liberty in early America was you give everything to the Lord. Your home, your children, your business. So you could stand in that town hall meeting and they would threaten you. We're going to take your family, we're going to take your property, we're going to take your very life. And you say, you know what, I'm not moving. See, that, that's true liberty. We don't have liberty today because somebody threatened you. You're going to say, oh, they're going to take my property, they're going to take my children, they're going to take my life. And so now you're a slave to sensuousness. You're a slave to this world. So we don't have an attitude of liberty today. Well, the French Revolution was liberty of sensuousness. Not doing what's right. Not righteousness. Totally different. So Tocqueville never understood what this nation was all about. He saw it as all these people who come from Europe through dialectical eyes. Through human relationship eyes. And not absolute position eyes that God has given us. See, God, again, the garden said, having eyes they cannot see and ears they cannot hear. We lost that. Because we rejected righteousness as a way of thinking. So let's look at human nature. The word human isn't in the Bible. Uh, man is, but human is of the earth. So if we're just material that we can be manipulated, then this is how you have to view man. The environment affects us naturally. Uh, I'll just abbreviate here. There's touch, taste, sight, smell, sound. Those are the senses that we use to get information into our brain. There's really no other, materially, there is no other avenue. Um, and so a nerve is activated 
you touch something and it sends a message, it's de-ionized, very complex, a lot of little gates in here. There's a website, McGill, out of McGill University in Canada. It's really neat. I mean, their philosophy is dialectic, but the science is awesome because they go into the brain and all the nervous system. Well, this, uh, this nerve is activated and it gets to a little gap here. Chemical is produced, called, uh, they're called neurotransmitters body naturally produces some 50, 60, it's really complex. Some of them will, sometimes it's two or three that are released at the same time and sometimes one of them will have five or six different receptors to affect on this side. So it, that's any time you take medicine there's a downside. It's just an unbelievably complex language in the, in the nervous system. And then that message is uh, sent across here by this chemical, hits the receptor here, sends a message on up, you know, electrical impulse, this is chemical, this is electrical. Uh, up to the brain and in the brain there are a trillion plus or minus nerves and between these nerves there can be some sometimes up to 10,000 dendrites it's like branches of a tree and those dendrites connect with other nerves and they have a little gap called a synaptic gap in them as well and there are neurotransmitters that are produced in the brain so anytime you learn something that information is stored right up here. They don't know whether it's in the dendrite or in the synaptic gap, but you've got a lot of stuff up there to store information. Uh, and, and so the, these chemicals are key to this. Now, since the world is focusing on pleasure, there, there are chemicals that deal with pain, but the ones I want to focus on are pleasure. There's ones called GABA, that's an acronym for a technical term. I can't remember what it is right now, but, but it has to deal with sleep. Anytime you enjoy sleep, that's GABA. Now it's very toxic. You have to be careful with GABA because when a person has a stroke, uh, the blood vessel is ruptured and the GABA is broken here in the nerve uh, and then it will actually eat the cell lining of the other nerves. So that's why you get them to the hospital and you know there's stuff you can take that to counter the effect that that because it'll just keep doing damage. Uh, and God uses that dual duty because GABA will dissolve and break down the other neurotransmitters. Because you have to, it's like Morse code, if you just keep pushing the key down, all you get is noise. And so there's this, there's this, uh, well, then there's serotonin. Now women only have a third of the serotonin as men do. That's why women become depressed quicker than men. Uh, a liberal a few years ago wrote a book that men were different than women. Now for a liberal to write a book like that it was pretty traumatic. Last chapter in her book she actually uh, apologizes for the facts. What she found out is men in the workplace, when they get frustrated, somebody ticks them off, uh, they, they, they either, they call it uh, fight or flight. You know? And this is just natural man. You know, it's not a, a believer, but uh, he, he will, you know, you want to punch the guy out, right? But you can't do that. You get fired. Now, if the guy's too big and he chases you, you have flight. You run from there. Well, you can't do that either because that, you know, you're the butt of everybody's joke. So what do you do? You go sit by yourself. So when men are frustrated, it's like, get out of my face, let the adrenaline, you know, and I'll figure out how I'm going to get around you the rest of the day or the week or whatever. And, but that, that fight or flight is that he, every policeman knows that. I mean, when they, they're looking at body language, he's looking at your eyes, they're, they're trying to figure out anything, what you're going to do. Happy feet, they call it. Uh, and so it, it's important to know that. I mean, if you come up to somebody, you, you want to, okay, is this a friendly or a hostile? And so you pay attention. You, you, same thing at night. You're walking at night and you hear a sound. I mean, isn't it amazing how quick those chemicals react? Well, the guy will sit by himself. Now, women are different. Uh, women have a hormone called oxytocin. And when they get ticked off, they like these terms, they will tend and befriend. In other words, they'll go make coffee and sit down and talk. Men don't go make coffee and sit down and talk. You tick a man off, he's not going to go over to the coffee pot and sit down. Well, let's talk about this. Women do that. And so that's why God said to Adam, rule. Not autocratic, but rule. I gave you a system to make decisions. Now, recently, a, a minister in Fort Worth, a friend of ours, he'd earned several degrees, a uh, uh, very bright man, um, he, uh, and then he came to the Lord. So those things were all, all of no value. But he was sharing about how the wife is to submit to the husband. And he says, nobody's really 
looking at the Greek, what it means, it doesn't mean that the wife is to be treated like a dog, submit, submit, submit. She is to petition. She is to submit to her husband everything so that he can make that decision. And the husband has to let her submit. Even though he's going, Arr! she has to be free to submit. Of course, there's this top down, but she has the freedom to share. Then he has all, because the husband isn't really always sensuous based. The wife is sensuous based. She's picking up stuff around. The husband's going to be missing. And so it's important for that, the, the health of the home to have those. And you see the way that God has created us. Now, the, the problem with men is they don't want to rule. They want to let the woman make the decisions because then if it fails, look at Adam. Oh, it's not my fault, it's this woman's fault. Why? He followed her. He, God said rule. He was supposed to jump in there and say, hey, wait a minute, who are you talking to? You know? And she was, desire your heart is to the husband. She was to turn to him and say, hey, this guy's sharing some stuff with me. You know, what's your position on it? Let's skedaddle. You know? Instead, he followed her. Destroyed the top-down system. Went equality of opportunity. They both did the same thing. Adam knew, but he didn't. But it wouldn't have happened if the order had been in place. And then, again, children obey your parents and the Lord. What a wonderful system. They had to be destroyed. See, Marx wrote 11 theses on Feuerbach. The 11th is most quoted. The philosophers all interpret the world in many different ways. The objective, however, is to change. Well, see, so you come in here with your opinion. We all come in here with different views on things, and we can butt heads, and you can say, well, I'm right, and, which means I'm wrong, and I can say, well, no, I'm right, which means you're wrong. And, see, we all have different ways of looking at things as far as information goes. Mark says, we'll never have peace that way. Let's just practice the process of change. Let's just practice the dialectical process. Now, and it's called praxis, which is practice. But number four, I think, is the most powerful. It's two paragraphs, but one sentence. The last sentence in number four, Feuerbach thesis number four, is once the earthly family... See, over here, I'll back up here for a moment. Once this earthly family is discovered to be the holy family's secret, Marx wrote a book called The Holy Family. Showed actually how to destroy this system. Uh, in fact, I, I, I just... Uh, in your material here. I'll read this. Just see what you, uh, if you can figure out who wrote this. The unspeculative Christian, that, that's this Christian right here, the, the believer, um, also recognizes sensuality as long as it does not assist itself at the expense of true reason, which is a faith, of true love, which is a love of God, of true willpower, of will in Christ. Not for the sake of sensual love, not for the lust of the flesh, but because the Lord said, increase and multiply. Isn't that good? It's Karl Marx. Then he said, <clears throat> they have sensuousness. If we can just bring a little sensuousness in their life, we got them. Remember the prophet who was supposed to curse Israel? Didn't do it three times. Couldn't do it. He, you know, he, he wanted what the king wanted to give him. But he, he didn't get it. But then the advice to the king afterwards was you can get them when they come in to the promised land through sensuousness. It worked. See, when God took Israel out of Egypt, he took them out of the leeks and melons of Egypt. Put them in the desert over here. And that's what God has to do with us too. Well, I'll get into that in a little bit. Now, so serotonin, and, but the one I wanted to focus on is dopamine. Uh, wow, this thing, this, this chemical plays a big part of our life. And God gave it, these to us. I mean, it's not like he's against this. It's just how we use it. That's the problem. Uh, all habitual drugs are tied to dopamine. Uh, even caffeine or tobacco. Anything that you become dependent on. You know, if you run out of it, you start shaking. I've got to have more of it. Uh, methamphetamine will, will sometimes keep a person awake for 27 days. I was just told by a policeman a, uh, a little while ago that one of the giveaways for people taking meth is the house is spotless. I mean, toothpaste, you know, toothbrush spotless. Way in, because if you're awake all the time, it gets boring. You start cleaning stuff that doesn't need cleaning. 
you know, way beyond normal. So there's just, I'm not saying that so anybody you know, figure out how to, you know, mess the house up so you not get caught. But, but meth, uh, it, what happens though is it stays in this gap so long that this little factory here that has to produce these chemicals, it doesn't have to produce anymore, so it shuts down. And so when, when the meth then runs out, the person, yeah, goes deep into depression, they will kill. They'll do anything to get that, that, those uh, juices of pleasure going again. And that's why the police are so harsh because, you know, a guy in three days, you're paranoid. You can be, you meet, you know, as a policeman, meeting somebody who's just nice and t in a nanosecond, they'll turn around and kill you. So th th it's changed our culture. It's, it's made it, uh, you know, the, the serve and protect branch of our uh, culture very harsh. They have to be. I mean, unfortunately, because it is life or death. Uh, and so all of a sudden you find this, uh, there's a battle now between who's serving and who's uh, doing the service or who's uh, to be served. Well, dopamine also, and it's, it's God's, like I said, is not against dopamine. He gave it to us. You smell bread. You know, you come in the house and smell bread. Dopamine. Uh, you uh, see something that's, uh, you know, sunset. Dopamine. Somebody compliments you. You know, I like your shoes. Or, you know, you just feel the dopamine. Or somebody, you know, good grade. You get the dopamine. So if you don't have any dopamine in you, I don't want to be around you. You're depressing. You know, whenever you do a good job, you stand back and you go, oh, that's good. You can feel the juices flowing. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, now, two-year-olds are nothing but druggies. That's all they are. They're just chasing the dopamine. You know, you give them a little blank piece of paper and you hope they work on that thing for 15, 20 minutes. And, you know, they're, oh, it's a nanosecond. You know, they draw three lines and you go, that's all? Yeah, that's all. See, once you learn something... The dopamine's released while you're learning it. And then if you have to go over it again, it's like driving down the road. Second, third time, it's less dopamine. And hundredth time, it's boring. You can't get any dopamine out. So you say, well, can you draw any more? No, there's no, 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 there's no more dopamine left on that blank piece, on that piece of paper. Now you leave the room. You haven't quite caught on yet. Maybe, maybe they'll go ahead and put another line on there. And uh, you leave the room and they look at the wall and they go, dopamine heaven. <laughs> and and you got to come in and here here's the key is the mind now in the mind we have eyes and we look into the environment because the dopamine is a want that's all it is you, you're not even aware of it you touch something you may not even be aware of it until it gets to the mind but the dopamine's already secreted and your body already wants it and then, in, this is the flesh. This is just natural of the flesh. Paul says there's no good in the flesh. He didn't say the flesh was evil either. See? But if you make this, see, see the logic? If you make this the purpose of life, mm, we got a problem. Because in the mind, then, at the eyes, you look into the environment, what did it? We're naturally approaching pleasure. You don't get up in the morning and say, I want a little pain today. No, you get up. It's our nature as children to want pleasure. The problem is, God knows he calls me a child because I'll get up in the morning grabbing crayons head into the wall. See, Because I'll look out there. Wow, it doesn't take you long to figure out what is... This is positive social change. You ever heard about being positive? It is positive to our flesh to go this cycle. So now, if you can... The reason you're looking at the environment because you want more. You then, if you can control the environment... If I can control this environment, now I have pride. Why do you build a beautiful home? Because every time you go home, dopamine. And the more beautiful the home, then the neighbors go by and they go, oh, that's a beautiful home. More dopamine. So it's our nature to control the environment for what? Dopamine stimulation. And so the child is just learning that. Now, how do you get them off of that? Is you interfere in their, they're going to control that environment, and you say, no, you cannot. According to social psychology, unless that's of nature, if it's coming from above, that's neurosis, see? If it's of a nature, then it's just we need to work this out so that everybody can get the dopamine, the pleasure. This is the dialectical cycle. 
all of the world. What is it? Lust of the flesh. It's not lust until God says no. It's not lust until the parent says, you can't write on the wall. See the same these Marxists, these were Marxists who studied these systems from the scriptures. And they realized, okay, we don't have to come in and tell you not to believe in God. What we'll do is we'll destroy the system that God has given us. You know, so you, that we'll change, as Dorno said, we use social, all your friends, environmental forces to change the ch parents' behavior towards their children. See, and now, see, it's a little scary to go out and chasing your child out there in public. Because Child Protective Services, which is all concerned about your child's dopamine, will come and tell you, you can't do this, so therefore it destroys a system of righteousness. The system is not righteous in itself. It won't save you, but it's a system God needs. For you to, you know, when he comes to the door, he'll say, hey, I know that voice. See, it's faith, belief. You have to have faith first. You can't have belief without faith. Faith first in the authority, belief in his statement, obedience to his command, and then we need chastening to keep us in that cycle. Okay. That has to be destroyed if you're going to do this system. This is, this is the UN. This is the whole, everything is consensus with the sensuousness. We have to make sure everybody in the room gets a fair dose of dopamine. It's a worship of man and his nature. And so when you come in with righteousness, see, approach pleasure, avoid pain, that's a spectrum. You determine how worthy your day was based upon the amount of pain versus pleasure you received. Don't you? Hey, everything goes wrong today. It's a whole bunch of pain. I had a rotten day. With God, it's not pleasure or pain. It's righteousness, unright. It's a light switch. This is a spectrum. This is a grading system. This is gray. And God says, "Watch, walk righteously and you'll become a witness. Martyrius. Sounds sort of painful, doesn't it? How do you market the Word of God? Marketing is here. How, how do you market suffering? See, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Deny yourself. Wait a minute. Self is here. Deny yourself. That's individual. You got to get control over this drug, and pick up your cross. That's what everybody else. Picking up your cross isn't that you had a this thing. Your car broke down. And everything else went bad. Picking up your cross is you came in the room and spoke the truth, and then your friends martyr you. That's what they, they put you on the cross. The community. It's social. It's the social that puts you on the cross. But you can't pick up your cross until you deny yourself first, because when they start to put you on the cross, you'll say, "Well, wait a minute. I, I think we can talk this out." And, and you won't be a witness. And then Jesus said, come follow me. And it, and that's awesome. Didn't Mark just study this? They get an A. We don't. Our ministers don't know this. Because they're marketing the church on this cycle. Yeah, I'm going to mess you up. Go to the next service where they have the big screen and they'll have the waterfall going with the scriptures up there. Now remember, God removed Israel from Egypt. Leeks, melons, cucumbers, then he added garlic. Man, how can you go without garlic? And then, what's this manna? He took him out of dopamine zone. Now, what do you do with somebody who's on a drug? You remove them from the source, right? And you isolate them. That's all God did. He took Israel out of dope land and put them in the desert and got them off the drug. He, he only succeeded with two their children then went in, see. But they, he, how do you get Egypt out of the children of Israel? See, that was the problem. You could get them out of Egypt. And we have a problem today. Is that we have now become a, a, a land of Egypt. We have sold our soul to the pleasures of this life. Is God against this? No. It's just that he doesn't want this to control us. And when you get people on a drug, you can't talk to them. Does this make sense? You start talking to people using a system. This traditional system is preach and teach. It's not dialogue. This is dialogue. Dialogue is, can we, dis the, the, the conversation. It's, boy, they're using this word all the time, conversation. Conversation is sort of casual. There's no confrontation in conversation. Well, as a believer, you're going to have confrontation. You have to confront yourself. 
That's how you deny yourself. You have to die daily. First thing in the morning, say, you know, again, oh, God, I want to serve you, but I want to have a good time today. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. First thing the flesh is going to say, no, you won't. And then you've got to quote another verse. Take care of that one. Because that's just the devil sticking his head up going, no, you won't. You know, and just going to wear you out. So wear him out. What did Jesus do in the temptations? He wore the devil out. He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And he couldn't handle it. Oh, by the way, he did respond, it is written, see. So the devil knows scripture. Jesus just trumped him on the word. Don't tempt God. See, God. God loves you and me, but he's not moving from his word. And you can love your children and you can love your neighbors, but don't, as a believer, move from the word of God. Have the same system. Now, it doesn't mean you, you, you know, you can quote the word of God and do it in hate. We're to proclaim the truth in love. See, I've met too many Christians who are just beat you, beat you to death. But a word spoken in right circumstances as an apple of gold in a setting so. So you wait on the Lord in what to share. And eventually, it just becomes natural because it's not you sharing, it's God in you. See, it's the Holy Spirit. It's Christ in you that's speaking. And we grow, see, like children. We grow, we mature. Well, here, here uh, the two-year-old, you go to the store to buy a gift for him. Dopamine. Nothing wrong with that. You take it home, you wrap it, dopamine's flowing in you, uh, you're anticipating their fun, and then uh, they take that wrapper and they're tearing it off, and you see the dopamine flowing in them, and they, they're so thrilled, they see that little truck, you know, and they're shoving it around, and you're getting dopamine, and they're getting dopamine, wonderful time. And then, you go make lunch, and you call them, you know, come and eat. You know, silence is a real giveaway, something's wrong. And you come around the corner and they're still pushing that little toy. And you take it away from them and put it on the shelf and you bring them to the kitchen and, and you turn around and, uh, and then you turn around to see them at the table and they're gone. And you go around the corner and there they are, they're that toy, they're pushing around again. Now you take it out of their hand and you give them a little swat. Ah, neurosis. You're damaging them because you're teaching them an accountable higher authority and they can't discover their full potential, which is right here. And so you eventually have to chasten them. See, you're getting them off the drug. It's not that you don't want children to have pleasure. God wants us to have pleasure. But he's got to get us off the drug. Now these kids are on this, you know, all this entertainment. If you look in their brain, it'd just be a spick of dopamine flowing. You get a culture on this. You can be a tyrant and they'll steal. As long as you give them crumbs from the table, they'll still come begging to you. They become slaves, and they're happy slaves. As long as you keep the circus going, like Rome, they'll keep following because they're hooked on a drug. See how this worked? Because there used to be a nation of righteousness. There was a fear of God. I have yet to meet a church growth, emergent church minister that loves the Word of God. See, they love their opinion of the Word of God because your opinion is here. This is how you feel what you think. They do not love the Lord, nor the Word. Every one of them goes dialogue. I've had a minister yell at me in Florida for 45 minutes on dialogue. We've got a dialogue. No. On a day of judgment, you stand before God and say, Well, God, I think. Well, I felt. Or I thought. Jump out of a plane at 20,000 feet. You can have all your opinions you want. You can go, I feel and I think. You know, as long as you, eventually you're going to hit an object, and at that moment, it won't matter how you feel or what you think about anything. See, and so this is where God wants us to come to is obedient children taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's a top-down system. It's not an oppressive system. God created us. And He loves His children to have the joy of the Lord. Joy the world can't understand. The, the, the world understands the dopamine, but not the joy, which is spiritual. Because the Father gives us His Word. The law comes from the Father. You're wicked. Jesus redeems us from the curse of the law. Not the law. He didn't destroy the law. And then the Holy Spirit in us fulfills the law. So it's not a yea or nay anymore. You think the Holy Spirit's going to break the law? No. It's a yea. If you're walking in the Spirit, you're just going to do things naturally, spiritually. That's why we walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Because if you walk in the flesh, there's that law. You know, before I came to the Lord, I hated the law. But after I came to the Lord, I love the law. Because what does it do? It shows me God's mercy. 
and His grace. That's why Paul says, I love the law of God, but it can't save me. Can't save me. And so there, there, there are a lot of Christians today running after the law. And there are a lot of Christians running after the dopamine. That's One's licentious and the other's legalistic. And they're leaving Christ, which is liberty. In Him, I'm free. But daily dying to myself. Daily, i got to hear Dad saying, no, nope, you can't do that. Oh, are you sure? No, nope, can't do it. And, and, you know, because with our eyes, again, the eyes are stronger than the ears, by the way. The TV knows that. That you can see the commercials today, they'll say, it's going to kill you, it's going to kill you. But you're watching this happy face and you never hear, it's going to kill you. I took film arts from a guy who was in a national train lab. And I, I should have written a book from what he, what he wrote, all about the use of eyes, the visual, to manipulate people. To, to follow the sensuous and the gate. The, see, the Word of God comes by what? Hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It's interesting that you can go, in, even with young children, and even if it's King James, read the Scriptures, and they'll still. still. They'll, you know, I, I don't know, I'd be careful on that because I think some situations they might not. But, but there is, the, the Word of God speaks to the soul of man, not to the head. That it, it, that's part of it, but it really speaks to the soul. The Ten Commandments speaks to the soul. Lying. It doesn't matter if you're 333 or 93. You know when you're lying. It has nothing to do with whatever it is you're lying about. You just know that you're lying. You, know, you tell your parents, well, I wasn't lying when you were three. And then when you're 33, you, you have a time where your parents say, oh, you know what? I was lying, but I wasn't going to tell you. You know when you're lying. And so that's God speaking to our soul. But this speaks to our flesh. And we love it. We love our flesh. Um, and when you put money in the bank, it's drug money. Do you, do you ever take a trip for pain? Yeah. No. It's for good food and you know sunsets or mountains or trees or whatever it is that stimulates the, the, the touch, taste, sight, smell, sound of our life. So we, we really are, it's easy to pull us into this. It's, they call it a shift. It's easy. If we focus on what we want to do, it's easy to get rid of what God wants us to do. My will be done is really on the table. First thing, uh, when God comes in and says, my will be done, then there's this, it's easier to do my will than God's will. Now, uh, having said that, you tell your sons, for instance, friends come by and they're going down to the park, dopamine time, good time, but you say, no, you can't go out. Now, there really wasn't anything wrong with them going out to the park, but you said, no, you cannot. Now, the only way we can get out of a not, which is right, wrong, black, white, sheep, goats, heaven, hell. There's no gray with a not. You ever notice that? There's no dialogue with a cannot. And the only way we can redeem ourselves or rescue ourselves from this patriarchal, top-down system, black and white, biblical structure is dialogue. Why? Why can't I go out? And as a parent, we would stop that dialogue because if you go into the dialogue, dialogue brings sensuousness to the table and it negates the preaching and teaching of righteousness. So how do you rescue yourself from the dialogue. I'm not saying we don't dialogue with the children, but there are just times that this does not need dialogue and you're too young to understand and I'm making the decision and this is the way it is. And so you stop the dialogue with because I said so. And we all hated to hear that because there was no dialogue. You can't dialogue with because I said so. So now you're stuck with if you obey me you're blessed and if you disobey me you're cursed. Well wait a minute. If I obey you, I can't go down to the park and get some dopamine. You're blessed. You're off the drug. See, that's why the homeschoolers, they didn't really, they thought, well, man, I don't really, I don't know, I don't know the math, I don't know, this. it had nothing to do with that. The kids can learn that. It had to be an environment where your children got off the drug. Because in this system, the effective domain is the drug. We'll keep those kids, that dopamine flowing in the classroom. And when they come out of the school system, a tyrant can offer them a two cars in the garage and they'll believe it. Because they, they cannot stand alone on a position on truth. See? They've lost that.
patriarchal paradigm, that way of thinking. This is actually, Bloom calls this lower order thinking skills. Well, you don't want lower order thinking skills when you're on cars. You want higher order thinking skills. But that's rocks and plants and animals. But if you use this scientific process on people, see, then if you, t if you take every person in a classroom to higher order thinking skills, there are no absolutes. Everything has to be questioned. But with the laws of nature, all the laws of nature is a not. That's why Paul said, deceived, deceived. So-called science. Avoid the oppositions of so-called science. It's not real science. Because it's, it's true science used on people, which no longer is a science. It's deception. There is an either-or. There's always been an either-or. There will never be anything but an either-or. But if we go over here, we can go gray. And that's the lie. So, what did God do? Uh, oh, by the way, when we cannot talk to our parents, we talk to ourselves. Of course, self loves dopamine, and we go ought. I ought to be able to go ought. Oughta, shoulda, mighta, coulda. Abram Maslow said we have to create an environment of oughtiness. How do I get your legislator? I get you. You have oughts in you against your parents. You have oughts against God. You have oughts against the higher authority that prevented you from doing what you felt like doing. All I have to do is create an environment, Rogerian psychology. I'll give you a PhD here. Rogerian psychology. You can learn all the data you want to. You can read all the books. But it's these two things. Open-ended. We can talk about anything. You know what the truth is? You can't talk about anything. There are things God calls an abomination. Let's look at what happened to David. David was supposed to be out with his troops. He had just built a new home. You ever walked into a new home? Well, you talk about dopamine. That's flowing. Nothing wrong with that. Then he's walking by a balcony and he looks over and he sees Bathsheba. There's dopamine. Nothing wrong with that. Until he wants more. This is why women are to dress modestly because even a righteous man, this part's going to take place. You cannot have this not take place. But if you have, today you turn on the commercials, Whoa, you, you turn on the news to find out what's going on. Before you even get the news, this thing is going. Because they know the news is going to liberate you from that top-down, right-wrong. Because news is now sensuous. Deliberately done. It's no longer, you know, it's gotten to the point of maybe the radio's it. Or the paper, and even that's questioning. Because you know, there's so much noise. That's the problem. There's just so much. You know how to neutralize you in a meeting? You might know the facts on whatever we're dealing with. None of the rest of us do. And I'll ask you to share, but I'll ask everybody to share. Mm -hmm. And you know, I might say the stupidest thing on the face of the earth, and everything in you says, man, we better not follow that guy. That's nuts. And you see the group actually coming my way, so you'll stand up and say, that's stupid. We can't do that. And I'll say, you know, that's really cruel. We gotta get along here. For the sake of unity, we gotta to tone it down. Now, if you keep insisting in your position, then everybody, not only have you been neutralized, because you get everybody's input, you just neutralize the truth, because now we have a room full of opinions. Now, I'll share, I've actually, in Huntsville, Alabama, this guy comes up at the end of the meeting, we hadn't quite finished, and he goes, well, it's just your point of view. Or it's just your opinion. I was quoting scripture. That's just your opinion. I said, no, it's not. It's the Word of God, because that's a trap. See, if I say it's my point of view, then it's not God-breathed. It's my, I feel and I think. And so I didn't buy it. I said, no, it's, it's the Word of God. He says, well, that's your, that's your opinion. And then I looked at him and said, you know what? You make a good Marxist. Because Karl Marx said, you must treat every truth and ideal as an opinion. So if I get everybody's input in this room, now, when you share in the truth, it's just another opinion. But if you persist, now your friends are going to start distancing themselves from you. So I've neutralized you, now I'll marginalize you. Because they see collateral damage, you know. They see you're going to take the hit, and they're going to distance themselves because they don't want to take the same hit. Afterwards, they'll say, oh, I agreed with you in there. You turn to them, Jesus said, I'd rather have you hot or cold because lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I'm in the middle of the battle, and you duck. And in this process, by the way, of two or three, here's a, a, a training man. I call it a cookbook on humans, Human Relations and Curriculum Change, published 1950. They actually stayed in here. Uh, you know, if two or three would stand up in the meeting, they have to close the meeting. 
It's a treasonous meeting. It's a meeting to destroy the conscience. Conscience is con science with science. Chili con quesa with cheese. But this is with science. Science is, is and not. We have to get to consensus, which is with the sensuousness. And the only way we can go from conscious to consensus is through confusion. In other words, you're caught in what's called cognitive dissonance. You're caught between your belief and your behavior. Your behavior and my behavior are sensuous. Our belief is not. And so th that was, uh, and I'll get into the garden here real quick on what Satan did with Eve. But I have to get to your ought because it's your ought. If I get you to share your ought here today, any thou shalt not that you verbally, you will destroy. I don't have to tell you that, that whatever you believe in is not right. If I get you to share your ought, you will agree. You will do it. And that, this is what Satan did. Well, this is subconscious. You're trapped here. And so my role as a facilitator to your legislator, he goes to represent your position, representation. I get him in a subcommittee, get him to share an oddity. He just got rid of you, the constituent. Now it's his feelings, his thought of the moment, sensuous. And I want him with the group to come up with what seems to be the answer. This seems to be right. When I came here, I thought this was right. But now I'm in touch with the feeling of everybody else in the room. We all feel like it ought to be this way. So now it seems to be this is right. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth to be right in a man, but the end thereof is death. See, all of this, Her Herbert Marcuse's book, Eros and Civilization, I was reading it when 3 o'clock in the morning, having the best Bible study. Because there wasn't anything in that book that you can't take the Word of God to. He counters everything in the Word of God. That's all these guys were doing. Like here, he, Mark said, Mark clearly defined this paradigm. Because if you want to destroy it, he says, once you realize this is God's secret, we don't have to come in and tell you not to believe in God. We'll just destroy this system in your life. And you won't be looking for God. You're God. You can decide for yourself what's right and wrong. And you can, all we've got left is our sensuousness. And this is reasoning. Can't you be reasonable? You don't make any sense. See, it, and that all our reasoning ties to the sensuous. So let's look at what happened in the garden. Satan approaches Eve. And, and here's what, first of all, what's happened. That they, God put all these trees in the garden. And he says, go for it. There's dopamine there too. You know, not just food. Uh, but he says, okay, you cannot eat of that tree. And he sticks it in the middle of the, of the rest of the trees. But every time he's going by that tree, what's happening? And Adam, dopamine. Cannot do that. But it, then, then, you'll die. Don't know what that is, but doesn't sound good. So you just walk on by. And you're really not thinking at that time. You're just responding, you know. Uh, Satan comes along. And he throws a sentence structure at Eve known as neurolinguistics, most powerful tool in hypnosis. Embedded statement and a question. It's really convoluted, but it's to get your ought out. Because you, you'll hide this. You, you say to your parents after they say you can't go out, well, I ought to be able to. Well, you think you were in trouble before? <laughs> this is rebellion. This is challenging their authority. They're going to take care of that. So you suppress it. My role as a teacher was to liberate it. See, they talk about dopamine. When this is released, it's emancipated. It's liberated. So my role is to create an environment where that dopamine can be free again. Because the ought is the pleasure of this life. And that God or parent or somebody has inhibited you from experiencing for yourself. See, now learning is it's called education nation. That's a new phrase. They just came out with it. Education nation. Because education is this process. It's no longer teaching facts. It's dealing with feelings. Make the customer feel good. Well, sometimes the customer is wrong. You better be careful today, right? You got to make sure that customer feels good. Don't tell him that what he's doing, you know, or what he's planning to do, or what he wants isn't going to work. And so that puts stress because all of business, ISO, International Standards Organization, is all the corporations have to do this process. 
You know, if you're GM and you sub or you supply to the supplier that supplies the GM to be ISO certified means 10 years of uh, to get there, and it's everybody, all the employees have to be doing this process. They have to be concerned about how everybody feels and what they think in regards to the product, rather than just working. Half of the meeting will deal with the product, the other half of the meeting will deal with feelings. And you're going to sit in those meetings and just go nuts, because there's no production on the other half. I meet the guys who build cruise missiles and do all kinds, they are just, they're climbing the wall in these meetings. And they're, and they're putting their jobs on the line because they actually want the thing to work and they're bucking the system. And some of them are losing their jobs. So Satan uh, approaches Eve, Yea, hath God said, Thou shalt not eat of every tree in the garden. Yea, hath God said is a question, but it's a statement. You shall not eat of every tree in the garden. Now, he did, in the Hebrew, they don't know where they end that with a period or question. I'll give you an example. I use a body part. I wonder whether you know where your knee is. Now, don't look at your knee, because I'm not trying to set you up for this. But, but if, uh, if I did, what would happen is your conscious mind, the cognitive, would just pick up the sentence structure. I wonder whether. I wonder whether it's going to rain. But in this case, I say, I wonder whether, body part, you know where your knee is. Well, internally, you pick that up because there's a language of the nervous system. That's why they call it neurolinguistics. And the language of the nervous system that ties to this cycle goes, yeah, I know where my knee is. My knee's right down there. And you can actually feel yourself moving to look at your knee. But your conscious mind picks that motion up because that stimulus response. says, no, he didn't ask you to look at your knee. Don't you know grammar? Didn't you ever take a grammar class? But internally, you go, well, it is my knee. I can look at my knee anytime I want to. Cannot, can too, cannot, can. And I've just, you sit in there mind your own business, all of a sudden I produce this two headed monster, cognitive, you know the facts you believe, effective, you want to look at your knee. But what happens then is you keep looking at me, but you feel your knee. I've sensitized you to the environment because that's, I have to do, I have to circumvent, I have to short circuit this way of thinking. And by getting this sentence structure out in the classroom, have you ever been told you couldn't do something you wanted to do? Wow, I got your child's attention. It's going to go home. Yeah, my parents told me to take garbage out and I didn't want to. And then I can use that sensitized environment to move them. Now, here's what Eve said to that neurolinguistics. Very powerful, by the way, because God said tree, right? Satan even said tree. But Eve said, fruit. Ooh, the juice is flowing. <laughs> that's, that's, and there is no word wasted in those six verses. And it, Walter Benjamin and others studied, Marx has studied those scriptures. That's the key to Gnosticism right there. Because the Savior in the Gnostic religion is Satan. And it's reasoning. Because he had to use reasoning, see, be rational. Can't you be rational, reasonable? to deliver them from this top-down obedience to higher authority that interfered with change. Because if they obeyed God, there was no change in the garden. So she says, For God has said, it's an opinion now, it's not what God said. For God has said, Thou shalt not eat of it. What's the next part? Nor touch it. See, lest ye die. So here's the nor touch it. You sh if I get you to share your opinion, you're going to include the dopamine. This is the problem. Christians are running down to the Christian bookstore getting everybody's opinion of the Word of God instead of reading the Word of God. I'm not saying you don't go get books and read them, but you weigh them to what God's Word said. Now, I've met, I, I have loved ones who are getting into some really heresy stuff. You know, rat poison is only 2% poison. And so they're reading some of this stuff, and it's just, you know, there's just some really late, deadly stuff. One, one of the teachings is God hasn't done anything without a man. Well, you stand before God and say, you know, God, you couldn't do it without me. You talk about a bug zapper. I don't want to be in the same universe. And I, I tell you, I like what one minister said, God hasn't done anything with man. See, it's not until you're dead that he can use you. That's what baptism is. See, you died to yourself. We keep resurrecting ourselves, you know. And so we have to die daily so God can use us. Otherwise, we get the glory. You know, the Lord's Prayer at the end. To thine be the kingdom and the power, and the glory. It's His kingdom. We want Him to be in our kingdom. No, He wants us to be in His kingdom. And it's His power, not our power. And it's His glory, not our glory. 
Because even the elders get, what, the crown? And they, what do they do? They give them back. None of me. He must increase, I must decrease. So you find this message all through the Word of God. Just dying, and it's work. Yeah, if there's any works salvation, it's dying daily. If there's any work, it's dying. It's not, uh, even in the prayer closet, you go in the closet, you don't tell anybody. Oh man, the flesh is going, man, I spent, 20, I spent half an hour, an hour, two hours in prayer. I've got to tell somebody. No. And by the way, you ever been in a prayer meeting and just, oh, he just, this guy just keeps going on and on and on. And, oh, God's going, all right, you're dying to the dopamine. You know, your flesh is squirming. <laughs> or Bible study, you know, and it just keeps going. You know, Paul would preach until somebody fell out of the window. That was what, 20 minutes? 30 minutes? I India and Africa, they'll preach all night. We don't have an American culture because you've got to give them jokes and dopamine and keep them going. It's not spiritual anymore. Because when you're truly walking in the Spirit, you can hear the Word of God and be sitting there all night long listening because you're hearing the truth and you're being set free. And that's why the churches in the foreign lands grow quickly. They mature quickly. You can have Christians in the church today 30 years there and they're shallow. Because they're hooked on, make me feel good and I'll keep coming back. See, once the church starts this, these ministers are afraid. These mega churches, they, they're, they're, uh, they're not sleeping at night. Because they know if they say something wrong from the pulpit, that's a big bill they have to pay. So they've got to market the dopamine to keep them coming back. That's an awful trap to get caught in. I just say you need to preach the Word of God until only those who love the Lord stick around. But you, you, I, every minister I know that's really word-based, 20, 30, 40 members of the church. You know, and I, I, you know, I've, I've been in some churches where uh, you know, guys come up afterwards and they're really processed. I mean, it's really, I'm going, this poor minister, you know, he has to deal with all these immature, and they're not even in the Word of God. They're just there for the fun and whatever they can get out to, you know, the entertainment. And uh, come back the next year to this one down in El Paso, and he went from 85 members to 35. And I said, well, what happened? He says, well, after you shared, m most of the members left. We decided to take the youth group and put them in with the church. Well, you realize John Dewey's system got the dopamine going, so the kids were squirming in the church. Before then, they would sit all the way through the sermon, literally hear the same message. They were getting an adult's brain as a child, the way my mom taught. And then what happened was they were squirming and the minister says, well, so, well your kids are really not behaving very well and yeah, I know we're having a hard time with them. Well, why don't we stick them in the back room and so that's where we put them. They went, ought to, should have, might have, could have, how do you feel, what do you think? And when I went to seminary in 74, that's the crowd I was hanging around with. They're all philosophical. All looking at the opinions of the world so they could decide how to interpret the Word of God. No longer interested in it, but interested in men's opinion of it. See, and so we, we really produced the problems we have today because we changed the system. When Moses presented the law, who was there? Dad, mom, the children. See, it was all getting this under control. Not negating it, just under control. So she says, uh, nor touch it. There's the dopamine. I ought to be able to touch it. Lest you die, she says not. Then Satan said, what? You won't die. And Eve goes, will too. Satan goes, will not. Eve goes, will too. Ever had the kids do that? You know, think about child abuse then. <laughs> Shut up. No, that's not what happened. Because if I get you today to share your ought, and I say, no, you're not, you'll agree with me. Satan became Eve's best friend. I get your child in my classroom... And I asked them, have you ever been told to do something you didn't want to do? I am now your child's best friend. Because you weren't there. Were they, you their best friend when you told them to take the garbage out? No. Because you didn't, after you told them that, you didn't ask them, well, how do you feel about taking the garbage out? My parents never asked me that. What do you think about taking the garbage out? Let's dialogue. No, I am doing that. That's all Satan was doing. We're going to dialogue the Word of God. You want to grow the church, get a Bible study. How do you feel? What do you think? See, instead of memorizing, applying it to your heart, you want to, you want to grow the church down? You start memorizing the Word of God, especially in this culture. You're going to have, the minister knows this. He knows, man, and by the way, the sermons can be good if the administration 
It's the environment, see. And so, in other words, he can preach a good gospel. And you're trained, by the way, in this to preach a good gospel for a year. Get the trust of the congregation if you're a new minister. And then say, oh, we've got some changes. See, and so you get the trust. You can then bring in changes through the Bible study. and, and, the, and I, Anyway, getting back. So once she says, uh, Satan says, no, you won't die. Now she looks at the tree. Their sight. This want is moving her into the dialogue, nor touch it. She looks at the tree now, and she is now a scientist. She says, it's good for food. Good for food. Was it? Yes. Yeah. Didn't kill them. They'd be there today, eating from that tree. They died because God drove them out of the garden and said, you're not going to eat from the tree of life. Because it had nothing to do with the tree. It had to deal with the paradigm. Your child doesn't get in trouble because you told him not to eat the cookie. The cookie didn't get him in trouble. Cookie wouldn't have hurt him. You hurt him. Because <laughs> of the paradigm change. They decided they were equal with you. And that's today, you know, parents are talking to the three year old, dialoguing with them. No. No, I'm not saying you do. You know, time, that's how you learn. The birds fly. Why? Because they have wings. Why? Because God created them. But they're challenging your authority. When they're challenging your authority, there's no dialogue. Because the office, dad and mom aren't perfect. We can always find fault with our parents. And our children find fault with us. And their children will find fault with them. But the office is. And Marx understood that. If you destroy the office, you destroy the very system that God needs for the next generation to fear God. And it's not a cowering God. I'm not saying the parents should be autocratic. To this, you know, where the, you're not to produce wrath in your children. But it is, they need that, they need walls. Some children, by the way, come with ball peen hammers and just tap on those walls. Some of them come with wrecking balls. You know, my, my oldest daughter, I think I only chastened her once, you know, and the rest would just look at her, you know. And she, she wanted to do what was pleasing to her dad. My son, whoo, totally, they all come different. And they're challenging that office. And God, they need that office. You know, you take a blind person and you put them in a room where they can never hit the walls. They'll go insane. You've got to know where the walls are. And God's walls aren't, you know, they're not, you're not in a cell. Because he does, you know, Paul was enjoying the dopamine as he was going places on a mission. You know, God's creation. I do too. I look at the trees and I'm always in awe. We can't even come, we can't even come close to what God has done in just a leaf. And so th that's, but Eve is now saying it's good for food. That's down here. Pleasing to the eyes. So that's good too. There's dopamine, dopamine. Oh, when Jesus said, it is written. Remember he was tempted three times? Same temptations as Eve. But he goes, he didn't go, I feel and I think. If anybody could have done that, he, it would have been him. But he goes, Dad says, it is written. It is written. Man doesn't live by bread alone. What's bread for? Touch, taste, sight, smell, sound? No. For the blood. Bread is for the blood. But by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. That spirit, what do you leave out? Dopamine. Not that he, 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 you, you'll get the smelling the bread. You go to the restaurant. What do you go to the restaurant? Ambiance. Right? Sometimes you just don't want to prepare a meal. But, but a lot of times it's you, you choose where you're going to go because of the senses, the feeding of the touch and the taste and the sight and smell of sound. Uh, and Jesus certainly loved around a meal. I mean, a lot of his teaching was around a meal. But it's every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. So then she says, it's, pleased, it's desirous to make one wise. So you're going to get good, good, good. When God created the world, what did he say? It is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. What's Eve doing? It is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. But God knows himself. Eve and Adam who followed her was deciding what is good from sensuousness, from the flesh. So what we find here is a sensuous need. The need came from the sensuous, the senses. Sensuous need. Sense perception. 
Faith comes by hearing, see, not by sight, and sense experience. Because if you don't control the environment, you can't guarantee more dopamine. Why is the boy or the child pushing the toy around? Is he in love with the toy? No. He's in love with the dopamine the toy stimulates. We have 40-year-old boys in love with dopamine the toy stimulates. Do you, why do you hang around people you like? This is going to really, this will devastate you. They stimulate dopamine. You love the dopamine. They stimulate. That's why when God looks at our love, eh, it stinks. God's love is different. No dopamine. When He looks at us, stinking rag. But I love you. That's, that's God's love. We, there's nothing, nothing in us that can produce that love. And without His love... See, when He looks at you and me, if He sees our love, that's wretched. But when He sees His love in us, that's my child. And you've got to die to yourself, to your love. That's why, remember the, the, prophet, the preacher, vanity, vanity. That's all we bring to the table. All I can bring to the table off for God is my vanity. And that's why the righteousness has to be His. It has to be imputed. I can't earn it. I can't. There's nothing I can ever do to merit righteousness. So it's a gift from God. It's totally by grace. It's His work and His work alone. All I have to do is accept it. And then on top of that, then he throws a little dopamine in. Not against it. It's not pleasure he's against. It's the love of it. They loved the creation more. He didn't say they loved the creation and didn't love me. More than they loved God. So she simply uses the dialectical process where she's now reasoning through her sensuous, sensuous needs, sense perception, sense experience, you have to eat it. Remember in a laboratory, you have to do it? You have to actually, when you mix chemicals together, you can't undo it. You, you change, and that's the whole process. You've got to get the kids in the classroom and experiment with them. They call, there are 10 national training laboratories. This human relations and curriculum change was published from the first one. Everything we're doing is in this book. Just this year, I, or last year, uh, they, in September in, in uh, China, they had the TQM conference. And I, I, I watched it because I thought, well, maybe I, there's something new. There's nothing new. Article 1947 in this book, that's all they did. There is nothing new. How old, how old is the new, new world order? <laughs> Genesis 3, 1 through 6. This is the new world order. It's that we've got to create this environment in the classroom, in the workplace, in government. Everybody, put, they call this sensitivity training. All our federal agents go through this training. To reactivate this system, circumvent. Because you don't want to tell these people they're wrong, because then there's a right, wrong, black, white. What you do is you become, if I neutralize you, marginalize you, you become irrelevant. If you're irrational, you're irrelevant. That's why you go to these A friend of mine says, it's like punching into a marshmallow. You come in, you, you oppose what's going on, and you expect some opposition. We're glad you came. I hope you felt better. And you, you just, you're left on the sidelines. And the world goes rushing right by you. And if you don't join the process, you're going to be left behind. That's why you, you, somebody asks, you know, can we use the process? No. no. You can't go back to the, the, what Satan, he was the first facilitator, he was the first counselor. He, he was the one who, this wouldn't have happened because there was a fear of God. There was a fear of the parent. That meant the conscience was still in place. It hadn't even been activated. But there was still this, this awe and dread of God and the consequences. See, today we have a culture that doesn't consider the consequences. There's a, there's a lack of accountability. So, uh, and then they eat of it, and Adam follows, and then when they approach God, remember, God goes to the woman, doesn't go to Adam. Excuse me, goes to Adam, doesn't go to the woman. Satan went to Eve. Because this, this is the matriarchal paradigm right here. This is the patriarchal. They also know that the husband, when he draws a line in the sand, it's here. The wife, here's the children down here. She draws it closer to the children. They're not interested in the children. 
Everything you see is child driven. You know, everything's focusing on children. They're interested on the child only to produce stress between the husband and wife because they have to destroy that patriarchal husband's rule desire with our wife is to her husband. Because once you destroy this, this uh, unity, this agreement, then you've, you've accomplished it. It's the family is moribund. Once you bring dialogue into the home, you make the husband, wife, children equal as a social unity, and the only way you can do that is dialogue, the patriarchal system is gone. Or J Jürgen Habermas, excuse me, I have too many names here. Jürgen Habermas, who is the most famous of all the Frankfurt School members, he's written the court system language. And in his theory and practice, he explains this. He says, if you come in with a categorical imperative, thus saith the Lord, it's written, and I get you to dialogue, you lost your religious foundation. It's that easy. See, this is why the ministers who are in this process, they defend dialogue. And everyone, when after, I try to be nice. I'm not trying to be hard on anybody. I say, well, it's a pretty broad word, you know. But no, it, what, at, at the end of the meeting, when they start explaining why they defend dialogue, it's always compromise. They want to live in this zone of unrighteousness. And they don't want condemnation in it. They don't want to totally die to the Lord. They love the pleasures of this life. And so the church will never grow any further than where the minister is. Because he can't let the church go past where he is because they'll bring condemnation and judgment on him. And so if you go to seminary, here's, here's where the Bible is really important. What's going on in scriptures is important to understand. A little history on the translation of the Bible, because there's the key. The old, the law and the prophets, I always say Old Testament, but it really never says Old Testament, it's the New Testament, but it's understood, but it's never said Old Testament. It's the law and the prophets. When they uh, had read Moses' works, the Pentateuch, after a while they start to fall apart. They go, we got a problem here. You know, Joe's, Joe's finger, or Isaiah's finger, is starting to scrub off this, you know, every time you scroll it out there, you're, and it's starting to wear this letter out. Maybe we would better copy, make a copy of this. Or maybe two or three. And so what they would do is they set up this system where you'd count seven lines down and twelve in, and so you'd have a seven here and a twelve here, and then you'd find this character, whatever character it is, and then you do several of these. You know, you do uh, hundreds of them. And uh, from all different angles, and you would make a copy then, and you don't copy words. Because words change over time, and you're tempted to say, oh, this word has changed, and you would change it to the new word. You copy characters, like the dots. It's like a photocopy. You're not looking at the text. You're simply copying the dots. And so this copy is made, and you might make two or three, and then somebody comes along after you've copied it, and they check it with all these checks. And if there's any errors, it's destroyed. So you pay attention to what you're doing. And then when it's done, and it passed the test, like the American flag when it's wearing out, you destroy the original. Wow. That's pressure. You better make sure who's ever working on that fears God and knows what he's doing. The New Testament was done the same way. There were variations, but the idea was you want to copy letter for letter. So the early church, your church, your fellowship might have, or a koinonia, uh, might have uh, Matthew. Another might have uh, one of Paul's letters. And so yours would say, well, we'd like to have what you got, and we'll make a copy for you, and you make a copy for us. And so eventually they become a codex, which means the, the Bible, as far as the gospel, is put together. And uh, so you would copy, and then this one would be destroyed, and, and you'd make maybe several to different churches. And uh, then, then sometimes they weren't destroyed. Sometimes they were kept. Somebody just wanted to keep it around. And so we end up um, around 1400. Well, let me give through this history first. So the Bible eventually is put together. Uh, through this method, following the old... And they, by the way, in the, the Law and the Prophets, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were wondering, do we have distortion here? No, the Dead Sea Scrolls found there were only a few minor non-doctrinal changes. So the pattern here was what's important. Even the Valdensians in Italy, they translated the Greek to the Latin, but they used the same system. 
so that a thousand years later you could take the Waldensians Latin and translate it back to the Greek and be right on. Because their agenda was to make sure every letter wasn't changed. Didn't look at the words, looked at the characters. Now, around 240 AD, uh, a man by the name of Origen, who is a Gnostic, dialectic, he gets a hold of the, the Codex and he creates a Bible. He gets, first of all, the Laws and the Prophets here, and he has his Gnostic Bible, dialectic Bible here, and then he, uh, in these columns, and then in this column, he translates to a Gnostic Bible, his rendition. Then he takes the new, uh, the new, the law, New Testament, and then he goes through his Gnostic and he produces his Gnostic New Testament. So it's a six column. He has six scribes. He, he this guy put out like six thousand works. Very bright man, but it was Gnostic. It was heresy, and his trick was not to challenge you. It was to leave out verses and to add verses that would allow him to stay in the church and practice his trade. So the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 4. At the end of that, he leaves out to thine be the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Destroys the dialectic. Because there's none of me in it. All I do is die and serve the Lord. Let him work through me. And so he drops that out. And you'd say, well, that's elsewhere in the scriptures, so that's no big deal. But it's important. It's in the Lord's Prayer. Drops that out. And then, uh, then Eusebius puts this together, and there's also an Alexandrian Bible that follows the same pattern. Eusebius puts it into one Bible form, and then Jerome produces a Latin Bible for Constantine in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, from there on, any time the Catholic Church runs across these guys, they burn their works and kill them. It wasn't just on the Crusades, the going down to Jerusalem delivering it, it was to kill these. This, this is the Vulgate. These were the Vulgars. See, these were the lower class idiots. You know, that's how, today how you'll be treated if you go to this source. Uh, even though they're, they're embarrassing, this source. Because these manuscripts conflict. Major doctrinal errors. No major, no, no doctrinal errors with these. Even though we, today we have six thousand plus manuscripts, they're all because of the method. That's what is the key. Well, then around fourteen hundred, the uh, the Muslims came into Constantinople. They were burning and looting and killing, and these manuscripts were were in the Eastern Church were sent up into Europe. Erasmus gets a hold of them. And he's, you know, there's a little competition. He's trying to get stuff together. And so, but he, the Lord leads him to get the main documents together and produces what eventually, he doesn't call it this, but eventually is called the Textus Receptus. And what that is, is a Greek uh, manuscript of the New Testament that all these have been pulled together because there were some commas and word differences. It's this source, this Textus Receptus, that Luther uses to translate to the German. Tyndale uses this same source to produce the Tyndale Bible. 80% of King James is Tyndale. The Shakespeare of King James is Tyndale. In fact, the Shakespeare of Shakespeare is Tyndale. So Tyndale didn't get Shakespeare from Shakespeare. Shakespeare got Shakespeare from Tyndale. And what Tyndale did was, whenever he was going from here to the English, if he found a word that was not contemporary, that would fit, the Greek could translate to the contemporary, he would find the word in English that wasn't even used, that would accurately convey the Greek. See, it's a lie when people say, well, we've got to change the Word of God so the generation can understand it. No. You don't change one word to the culture. You change the culture by the Word of God. See, and so that, that, that's part of the trickery, was if we can change the Word of God to fit in the culture, then it becomes sensuous-based. It's no longer righteous. It's no longer the Word of God. It's my opinion, my interpretation of the Word of God. It's not a translation. Well, then we have the Geneva Bible. Uh, eventually, King James Bible, because King James didn't like Geneva, because he had margins on there that criticized the king. And, you know, there's a state church issue. 
and then you have the Matthews Bible, the Hebrew Bible, uh, the uh, the um, then you have a Spanish Bible, a Norwegian Bible, but they're all coming from the same source, Textus Receptus. That was the key. I'm not King James only. Now, some people get mad at me, but I'll show you. You, know, you use power instead of authority. If you use to the, uh, yield to the higher power, then you have to obey Hitler. But the Greek isn't the word power. It's the word authority. So if I yield to the higher authority, God's greater than Hitler, and I say, Hitler, I won't do what you tell me to do, and my conscience is free. But if I have to yield to higher power, then my conscience is captured by Hitler. Important. Every word is important. So you go to Strong's, and it has the word for authority. So just a little Bible study. Hey, why, why would you put power in here? Well, because the king wanted to have power over the church. And he, doesn't, he uses the word church. It's not the ecclesia, which is the called out ones. You don't want the called out ones in here because called out of what? From under the state. <laughs> See, if the church is under the state, then the church is the harlot and the state is a beast. When Jesus returns, his, his bride isn't holding hands with anybody. It's just looking for him. And if it's not just looking for him, it's holding hands with the world. It's not his bride. See, Jesus changed everything when he said two or three. Up until the time you had to have ten. Two or three. You have a thousand people and just have the church with two or three in there. It's, see, the church is you, you who love the Lord, and me who love the Lord, come together. And we, who, two or three gathered in his name. We come in his name. You come in his name. I come in his name. The byproduct is our relationship. If our relationship is the agenda, then unity for unity's sake, we, because you see Jesus a little different than I do because you have more knowledge than I do, and so we have to come to where we can both agree. We have to use a friend, come to a user-friendly, non-offensive, readily adaptable to change Jesus Christ. That's a different Christ. But if you and I disagree on the Word, where do we go? If you come in the Lord and I come in the Lord and I'm in love with His Word, if uh, you say, well, I'm wrong, I'm going to keep going here. Because my source is here. It's not in my relationship with you. Nor is your source in your relationship with me. And see, the church has changed that all around. It's the institution that has now become... It's Catholic. If you're not a part of the institution, you can't be saved. See, no. My salvation is imputed by Christ to me. And then the byproduct is the church. See, and we just got to go back to the work. It's been confused because seminary, and I'll explain what happened in seminary with this. Well, okay, so the King James and all these different translations are from the Texas Receptus, 1881. Westcott and Hort, um, who were loyal Catholics, you know, hidden. They, they worshipped Mary. They were, you know, they were into the, the uh, unity mindset. Uh, they were Jesuit in structure of thought. They had up a committee that was supposed to simply, they had found a few, little, few more manuscripts and they thought, well, we'll add these and you know, just clean things up a little bit on the Texas Receptus. Like the Articles of Confederation, remember they were all, the, the colonies or states were supposed to come together and just do a re, just a few little corrections of the Articles of Confederation. What happened? They wrote the Constitution. <laughs> Patrick Henry said treason. Well, these guys were supposed to make just a few corrections, and Westcott and Hort take over the committee. They find Vaticanus B and Sinaiticus Alf and uh, Codex X, which are from the heresy sources, which were dated around 300 A.D. All these manuscripts that were, came to the Texas Receptus were 800 to 1400 A.D. And they said, well, these are closer to the birth of Christ. So these are more credible than the source for the Textus Receptus. But they're heresy. Now, this when they wrote the King James, if your minister was on that committee, he would come to your church, you know, the, the fellowship, and he would share what they were doing. That thing was in secret. But this committee became secret. See, and so they then rewrote the Greek to fit the heresy documents. Then when I went to seminary, I learned from the Metzger's Greek, which are also the Allen Greek and the Nestle Greek. They're, they're these three biggies. Okay? They're all, what they did was they would look at all these manuscripts here in light of these over here, these heresy Gnostic scripts, and then they would say A, B, C, D. So if you look in Matthew 6, 4, the Lord's Prayer, at the end you'll, you'll see at the bottom it says Textus Receptus, 
And it says, some versions will say, to thine be the kingdom, power and glory forever. You lower order thinker, you're unadaptable to change, you, you maladjusted person who needs some counseling with that old-fashioned way of thinking. And every time they have this heresy document that's in conflict with a Texas Receptus, it's an A. So you go to seminary with King James, which comes from the reliable source, you're going to be laughed out of the, out of the classroom. You're a blooming idiot. And if you're not using... See, all the contemporary translations come from this source. Now, Metzger is in trouble, and he knows that. Because some of these manuscripts, they've dated back to 64 AD that completely refute this. That's embarrassing. And so he's gone to the effort to find, well, we found some manuscript that was 200 AD. Well, we're a little closer, but it's still heresy. And he admits, this isn't working. Groff and Wellhausen were in error. Wasn't that great to know? But you go to seminary, they'll say the sixth printing from the first printing of the King James, there are over 150,000 errors. Well, here's the errors. Now, this is the lie. I, I'm tired of being lied to. I don't know about you. I'm sick. Because the more you learn the truth, the more you realize you've been lied to. Well, here's one of the errors. The first printing, they used the Gothic double V for a W. They said, you know what? Let's use the contemporary W. I'll take care of 100,000 errors. By the time you get done with all the, you know, just the word changes as far as the prefixes and suffixes, no change of words itself, you end up with only one word. They use good instead of God. One typo. Well, in, but they won't tell you that. Because their agenda is, this is the source. There's no profit to be made in King James printing. But all the contemporary ones, you get New International Version. I'm not saying you can't come to the Lord in New International Version. I'm just saying if you stay there, you won't go deep into the Word of God because you're going to start having conflict with this source. And so it's important you know, are you reading the Word of God? Now you go into the churches today and you say, I'm, again, I'm not King James only. And like I said, people get upset with me because they are and they're in error. But I'm Textus Receptus only. And, uh, it, but you go into the church today with the king. Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life as an example. He spent half a year writing the book. His mentor was Peter Drucker, who defended homosexuality until the day he died. Uh, I've, on my website, authorityresearch.com, I have sections from his speeches. I mean, this guy was really, he says, what's the purpose, what's the business of the church? <laughs> to make customers. How do you make customers? Dopamine sensitize them, they'll keep coming back. And you know, Rick Warren says, how do you close the back door? We're in minister, friend. How do you close the, the back door to the church? You do the group meetings. Well, Jesus had a group. Yeah, but he was preaching and teaching to them. He wasn't sitting around with Peter. Well, Peter, how do you feel about this? Or what do you, he, he asked Peter, who do men say that I am? But that's a didactic statement. And Peter's response is, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus' response is, Peter, this didn't come from you because you guys are all opinions. This came from my dad. That's a didactic, patriarchal statement. I'll build my church on that. See, it's not on Peter Pebble. The rock is the Word of God. See, I, 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 you don't hear this stuff, and yet it's there, staring at us. It was early understood in early America. But we didn't have youth groups. We didn't have make them feel good. And they'll keep, well, that was there too. But, uh, but it wasn't, there was still a fear of God and a love of His Word. People were willing to die for the Word of God. Now, you know, don't you know, go so far, but don't go too far. You know, he, I had one minister, in, well, here in California, down just north of L.A. Every time I took the group to the Word of God, he'd go, well, you've just gone too far again. You know, like I said, I, they'll yell at me. They've got a dialogue because they're not in love with the Word. They've had all this education with this stuff. And, uh, and, and, they, and they love the, the praises of men. That's unfortunate. But that's, we're back to the old scribes and Pharisees system. Well, so what we find then in the garden is, I'll get the right sheet here, we have a sensuous need. We all have sensuous needs. The environment is triggering them all the time. We have sense perception. We look into the environment. 
to satisfy this sensuous need. And then we, if we can control the environment, then uh, we can continue this cycle. And that's all from nature. What Eve did in the garden was nature. In fact, she's the first environmentalist. If you look at systems, she's the first environment. She looks and sees dopamine in the environment, and that is where life and truth lives. Because the moment she's doing, it is good, it is good, it is good. God's word, thou shalt not. She's not countering it. She's not saying God's wrong. It's irrelevant. Do you understand? You're irrelevant. They're just going to go around... Uh, Norma Brown says, by dialectical, I mean an activity of consciousness, circumventing formal logical law of contradiction. We'll just circumvent. How do I circumvent the parents' commands in the classroom? How do you feel? What do you think? I didn't say your parents were wrong. Because that would have that would have been confrontation. I just became very positive. Can't we be positive? Don't be negative. Because negative is confrontation. Negative is this is right and that's wrong. So if I make sure that everything in the room is just how we feel and what we think, I can literally wash from the brain of every... This is brainwashing. Wash from the brain of everybody in the room a top-down system. Same system. That handout I gave you. In the back, I show you, I, I give you, actually, brainwashing. The, the, the technical def Ed Grishin Warren Band has studied brainwashing so that it could be done on Americans because Bloom's taxonomy is all teachers certified on Bloom. When you read the steps of brainwashing and you read what's in these books, it's chilling. What's washed from the brain? Brainwashing was what Satan did with Eve because the moment she was doing higher order thinking skills in morals and ethics, the parent, God, became irrelevant. Wow. Not even up here. No conscience. You notice the conscience kicked in later. That's why they made clothes. You know. But these guys said, we've got to kill the conscience. Because Bloom says the conscience and superego function the same, substantially the same way. But the conscience always goes this way. It comes from the family. It can only be developed from the family. But if you get rid of the family, you've got to replace the conscience with a superego. The superego ties you to the dopamine of the village. And then he says, this is a development of the superego. So everybody, you and I are very conscious of what's going on around us, and we begin making decisions based upon what we think the village will say. Because it's all you see. It's all the kids can see in the classroom. And besides, if your child goes in and holds to the Word of God, they're going to become a witness. I pray, why would you even put your child in this? Because I want your child to be a witness. I want to show everybody how to martyr them. And I want to show everybody first how to convert them. Because we care about your child. But we want your child to put down the shield of faith to be a part of the group. But if your child puts down the shield of faith to be a part of the group, you the parent sacrificed your child to the beast, to the fires of the Moloch. Because nowhere in here did God ever say to experiment. This is an experiment. You know, this, this dialectical is, is a theory. We're going to practice theory. That's what you do in experiments. I think. I think this is going to work. Oh, your child blew up. Guess it didn't work, but you can't hold them accountable because you put your child in the laboratory. And so we trusted. This happened in the 50s. We trusted the education system. Wow, oh, are you against education? No, I'm not. But this isn't education, this is re-education, another word used for brainwashing. Because you were giving your children, even the whole, kindergarten was designed to allow your child to be socialized and undo the damage of the top-down system in the home. That's the only purpose. And we thought, well, it's so neat, the, you know, your child can play with toys, you didn't have the money to buy, and they could get and build relations with these other kids. And th There's nothing wrong with that, but when it supersedes, circumvents your authority as a parent, there's where the problem lies. And that was its intent. You, you see, man, a famous philosopher said, true science is sense experience, which is sensuous need, and sense perception, which can only proceed from nature. So what Eve did in the garden, Adam following, was sensuous need, dopamine, 
Sense perception, saw the trees were good. Sense experience, ate of it, all from nature. I just quoted Karl Marx. I can take all of social psychology. I can take Bloom. I call Bloom's taxonomy secularized Satanism, intellectualized witchcraft. They're the same pattern. Hegel's pattern, Marx's pattern. In fact, if you read Eric Fromm, his, uh, his quote in regards to the garden, because these guys all eventually go to the garden, he writes, Eric Fromm, Bloom says our worldview, our, our Velton Chong is Eric Fromm. Fromm writes, in the process of history, man gives birth to himself. In other words, we deliver ourselves from a, a restraint. This is page 9. He becomes what he potentially is. All we've got is a potential is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and prior life. That's all we've got. At the top, and he attains what the serpent. Who's Fromm's hero? The symbol of wisdom and rebellion. Where's the wisdom? The wisdom is Eve's justifying her relationship with the world. That's rebellion. The sensuousness becomes the rebellion. Promised, and what the patriarchal jealous God of Adam did not wish, that man would become like God himself. So now we are God. And you can bring God along as long as you humanize him. And then we have Herbert Marcuse in Eros and Civilization, a psychological inquiry into Freud. He writes, the original sin must be committed again. We must again eat from the tree of knowledge. And then uh, Norman Brown writes, to experience Freud is to protect a second time of the forbidden fruit. So when you read Eros and Civilization and Norman Brown's Life Against Death, all they're talking about is what happened in the garden. Satan is our savior. He's the one who delivered us from the patriarchal, jealous God who kept telling us what we could or couldn't do. Here's Freud's history. He, believes, he doesn't believe in the Bible account. He believes that there was a primal horde originally, a, fa a father and a mother. Of course, they have children. They, they procreate because that's what God said. Replenish. Valheim Reich, who Maslow loved, uh, he was having relations with anything to move. The guy was a pure pervert, and yet he's like God to these guys. He says, it's the large family you've got to destroy. Because, see, the large family inculcates tradition to three generations. A small family, see, if all Americans have small families, it just takes a hop, skip, and jump to undo all the history of the past. And so he saw the large family, because once you have six or seven kids, it starts getting, you start hearing this, you know, suck it up, we got stuff to do, we don't have time for a pity party. And so you start to just, you know, everybody's working, you gotta work. And that was early America. Now, man, you have five or six or seven or, I know families with 12 children, what's wrong with you? And I go into those homes, you talk about bright, clear eyes. Because they're not confused, because the dopamine isn't running their life. You know, but they're the neurotic ones. Child Protective Services are looking for those parents to get to those kids to rescue them because we will leave no child behind and all children are at risk. I hope you're, you're connecting where this is all taking us. Because you can't have a new world order, a global society, if you have nation borders. We are leader of our nation said we must in Berlin. Before he became leader of this nation, he said, we must break down, tear down the walls between the Muslims, Jews, and the Christians. Whoa, that's taking on God. So here's the father and mother. They have children. And according to Freud, children are all sexually active. Touch, taste, sight, smell, song. They can't procreate, but they have all the sensuousness that's involved with procreation. And they're having incest with the mother. Roe v. Wade, if you look at the, the, the law decision, they looked at the Christian faith. It's actually in there. That life begins at conception. Then they went to Socrates. Life begins at perception. If you can't see it, it doesn't exist. And they chose Socrates. Sense, sense experience over revelation. The truth. And so they're now looking at the cultures of the world because we've got to find what we have in common. You know what? There's a subculture in all cultures of incest. Look at what's happened. Turn on the TV. Look at uh, all these things that are all of a sudden just exploding around us. That's because the researchers, you know, the, the outcome is what you look at. They're looking at. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap. 
this corruption. And that's what they're looking at to justify the laws of the future. And so the children then, the father sees this behavior and he calls it polymorphically perverse. Now Freud doesn't think it is, but he's saying this dad's just all messed up. He thinks he's the one who has to dictate orders about how the family is to function. Well, he drives these children out, the rebellious ones. They meet and they come to consensus. They decide what's right and wrong based upon their feelings. And they come back and according to Freud, they kill the father and they eat him. Now, I, I studied a lot of Greek mythological stuff, you know, drama, and, and it was gross. And I thought, well, that's just Greek stuff. Why eat him? Well, here's the reason. If you kill dad, and Freud said, by the way, it's not a matter of whether dad's alive or not. It's a matter he no longer functions in that duty. So if you kill dad, the next generation would come by and see the tombstone over there and say, who's that? What's dad? Well, what happened to him? Well, we killed him. Remember the French Revolution? Killed Louis XVI and uh, the French or the Russian Revolution, Tsar Nicholas II. See, it's all, you got to kill that father figure. And, and, and what, what, what did he do? He kept telling us what we could or couldn't do. Well, was he totally evil? No. He loved us. He clothed us. He fed us. Oh, there's the conscience. We have a residue of righteousness. The conscience. So we've got to deal with the conscience. Bloom says we got to, we got to get rid of the conscience. And so now what they do is they set up a committee up here that sets up rules... Oh, now we have a law again that limits the relationship between the mother and the children. So we have a residue of the father figure. Freud called it neurosis of civilization. He didn't know how to resolve it. All he knew was to get you on a couch and get your ought to be, should be, might be, you know, out of you and at least deliver you one at a time. J.L. Moreno said to, to, he said he told Freud, quit putting them on the couch and get them in a group. If you get them in a group and get them to share their ought to be, You'll cook more people. And boy, hasn't it worked. So now, uh, when, you, when the children have ancestral relations with the mother, touch, taste, sight, smell, sound, but not to procreate, if you look at systems, that's the same system. What system goes on? Sexual activity that doesn't procreate. Homosexuality, pedophilia, bestiality. So the formula was right here. Now, Freud's hero is Narcissus, who looks into water, sees his face, and he falls in love, not with his face, but what nature reflects. Nature is reflecting back to him what he has in common with nature. So that's Eros. And then his other hero is Orpheus. Orpheus, if you, you have to get on the homosexual websites because they bury this because they don't want you to really know. They, the true story of Orpheus is, yes, he had a wife, but then she's, this is a story, but Greek story. She falls into Hades. He's singing, beautiful, you know, just uh, very, sort of like Lucifer. Remember, he was the organs and all, Isaiah talks about how wonderful uh, Lucifer was. Well, Orpheus is like that. And he, he is told he can go into Hades and rescue his wife. He's singing to do it as long as he doesn't look back and see her. But before he gets out, he turns around and looks at her and she falls in and he can't save her. She dies. Well, they'll end the story there, but the rest of the story is he becomes frustrated and he goes out and he makes love to young boys. So he's a homosexual. Okay, That's Freud's hero. You can't have Freud's psychology without Orpheus, a homosexual. And you can't have psychology today without Sigmund Freud. Now, when Bloom talks about this is a taxonomy of psychology of the contemporary time, that was the Frankfurt School, that's this Freud. So, look what's happened to our culture. Hasn't taken very long, has it? Because we turned our children over to the beast. You sow to the wind, you reap a whirlwind. God said, and I, in Hosea, because you refuse to recognize me, I am that I am, and my law thou shalt not. Remember what we did in classrooms. What's the next part of the verse? Oh, he said, my people destroyed for lack of knowing. Right? That's where he starts. How do we know? He said it. Why aren't we reading his word? Why aren't we in love with him? We're in love with ourselves, not him. 
He said, because you refuse to recognize me and my law. What's the rest of the verse? I refuse to recognize your children. Your children are bastards. See, And then Maslow said, the first thing I do with authoritarians is break their backs immediately. I treat them like the bastards they are. So we turned our children over to a beast system. And the church has joined. So the church today is a harlot having love with the world. And it's not the true church because the true church is the ecclesia, the called out ones. They will not bend their knee. Now, this is the process. The application is where it's tough. Because then you say, well, what do I do? Well, here's the answer. Because teachers come and they say, well, what do I do? I'm not going to give you that. You know, I'm not going to tell you you should teach or not teach. You ask the Lord that. That's all He wants. He just wants you to at least 20 times a day go, Lord, what do you want me to do here? He wants to be a dad with a child who comes up and asks for direction. It is not a man to direct his steps. God never created us. Look what happened in the garden. They decided to direct their steps. And Satan certainly going to come along. He'll promote you any day you want to direct your steps. But dad says, no, I want to direct your steps. So you ask him daily, Lord, what do you want me to do here? And you're in right... The kingdom of God... I've, I've come to understand the kingdom of God is simply doing what Dad says. That's all. Doing what Dad says. You know, we try to figure it out so we can do what we want to do. No. You just do what the Lord says. And you'll grow in His kingdom. See, grow in the knowledge of His Word. And so it's confident. The world will bring tribulation. God never brings tribulation. He turns us over to the world. See, there comes a time where God says, I've had enough, okay? And the tribulation comes. And then you find out who's of the Lord and who isn't. The world will simply either drive you to it or drive you to the Lord. I'm daddy's boy. When the devil picks on me, I run to dad. Now the wrath. See, Revelation talks about tribulation. The church is going to go through tribulation. Not the wrath. Because the wrath of God is upon the children of disobedience. And so there's an order in the world. I love it. What happened to Israel? Israel is the only culture on the face of the earth that would be given property language. God told Abraham, mark territory. This is my land, not your land. So all the nations of the world are getting rid of this not, but the, the Jews cannot. Because if they give their land up, they have no identity. They've they got to give up the word. You know, they need to come to know the Lord, but, but God's still in love with it. His name is you know, tied to that culture. They need to come to the Lord because that doesn't save you. But all the nations, God's going to put a hook in the jowl. That's communicate. That's law, language. That's laws of nations, and He's going to drag them to Israel because for judgment because they refuse to accept this patriarchal contract language. See, doesn't this and this? You know, again, we're not always right in this. You know, we we fail, but God is always right in the is and not. So trust in the Lord. With all your heart. Because if, you, if you're watching TV and listening to radio and reading the papers, you're going to become anxious. You know, read enough to know what's going on, but you know, how much trash do you have to go through to know what's going on? Because if you keep harping on I mean too many Christians are wringing their hands. What do I do? What do I? Because their eyes are looking at things of the world. Now, cast all your cares. Give all your things. Be anxious for nothing. See, when you've given the Lord everything, your life, your children, you know, we give Him part. We don't give Him everything. So, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge Him. Wait, all my ways? That's going to get me in trouble. All your ways. Are you my child? All your ways. You know, we, we're like the child, the parent puts a blanket on, you know, they sleep at night and they stick their toe out. I need that little zone of my own. And God says, I want you all. Because if you don't give me your all, you're going to go this way. That's a foothold. The devil can get a hold of and work you on, work on you. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding, because our heads will always go to the eyes. Read the word and 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 and, and pray. Pray for those who despitefully use you. you know, I meet too many bitter Christians because bitterness and depression comes because you're wanting God to do you what you want Him to do. So you're you're wanting you're forcing Him into your desired outcome. 
And we all have to. I tell the Lord, hey, I think this is a great idea. A lot of times I don't hear anything back because it, it evidently stinks, you know. Because we think this is how it should go. But we have our eyes to what the world is reflecting back. And God knows certainly more than we do in what, what our life is to be. So in all your ways acknowledge Him and let Him be the one who directs your steps. That's what it's all about. God is not hung up on this nation. Now, I, I don't defend the Constitution at all. It, it's a document of treason. I mean, it has language in there. That is absolutely dialectic. Bill of Rights, yes. <laughs> if it hadn't been for men like Patrick Henry who fought against the Constitution, we wouldn't have the Bill of Rights. Those are inalienable rights. They come from this direction. They're here. Human rights over here. You go to human rights, this is gone. So just, I wish I had known this before I took all those history classes. Because you take all that history and, and, and there's no word. Yeah, you might have prayer in a Christian college. You might have prayer before you start class. But it's all the Word of God. We fight not flesh and blood. This is, this is, this is spiritual. It's not academic. It's spiritual. It has to deal with righteousness. And the removal of righteousness. And the removal of the fear of God and love of His Word. Church talks about the love of God. But you don't really understand the love of God until you know the wrath of God and the judgment of God and the wickedness of men's hearts. And once you understand that, then you truly then understand God's love. Because we deserve, you know, we do deserve something. We deserve hell. Because all are condemned. But it's God's mercy and grace that redeemed us from that. Mercy is, mercy is uh, not receiving that which you deserve. <laughs> and grace is receiving that which you don't deserve. And that's our Heavenly Father. So I just encourage you. Why are we doing this? And one lady once said, why are you doing this? Well, first of all, God said, there's the door. You know, but, but I'm doing this to encourage. Because going through enduring, that's, that's part of this. Enduring is like changing diapers, not a dopamine moment. Enduring is standing and standing and standing and having done all stand. God hasn't called us to charge into battle or to run from it. Fight or flight. He's given us the truth, and you just keep holding to that truth no matter what. The battle will come to you. They'll seek you out because the, the Antichrist can have Christians around. He doesn't mind Christians as long as opinions. But you walk in the room and you quote the Word of God. He hates that because that brings condemnation on him. See, Jesus said, they hate me without a cause. But you know why the world hates him? Because he walked in the room and said, you're wicked. <laughs> That's all. He didn't judge any. He didn't. He didn't come judge any of us. He came to acknowledge the law that we're wicked, and then to to declare. Because to know that in Him His righteousness is imputed to us, you have to know the wickedness. And the world didn't want to recognize this is wicked. This is deceitfulness and manipulation, which simply justifies the wickedness of men's hearts. So I hope that's. Uh, you know, it doesn't discourage you because, uh, you know, if you're doing what's wrong, you know, I just say repent. If you're doing what's right, keep doing it. And, and the Lord can send you. Some people say, well, you shouldn't send your child here or there. I mean, definitely there are certain places, but the Lord has to direct us. Uh, and, and the homeschoolers need to realize that you, you're not raising your children up uh, for the girls to find a, a Christian husband. Or the young man to find a believing wife and a, a good job. You're training them up to be servants of the Lord. Because I meet too many homeschool kids, children, who are looking at the door. They're obeying mom and dad, but they're looking at the door. Because their life is not right before the Lord. And then I meet them whose life is right, life is right before the Lord. And those are the, uh, the clear-eyed ones. They just, they just have the joy of the Lord in their life. And uh, so, you know, whether it's... Uh, nowhere in the Word of God do we have a public school system. Now, that's where the church really made a mistake back in the 1850s. Um, and they thought it was for technology. No, no. Because actually by the age, the 8th grade, the child is 12 years old. That's where you start apprenticeship. They deliberately produce that four years of destabilizing the kids. They don't know if they're an adult or a child. It allows all this to take place. See, everything was delivered. It wasn't an accident. None of this is an accident. 
And, and the sad thing is, and it's sad, is that God warned us. But we, we turned them into wisdom you know, of the world rather than trusting in the Lord. So, any, any questions or anything? To, testimony? Why do you say that the uh, Constitution is a document of, uh, what you use, uh, treason? Well, yeah, because, first of all, we the people. See, we the people circumvents the states because you are protected by this, because all the states have recognition of God, except Hawaii. All the state constitutions recognize God as a sovereign and the God of nature. Now, they didn't want to do the federal because they were afraid we'd be like England. So you state, but the states understood that. You have power in here in the state. You can actually have influence. You can go to the legislature. You go to the federal. You're just nothing, see? And so the power was in the states. But when you say we the people, you just whew, circumvented the states. It should have been, and this is what Patrick Henry says, it should have been we the states. And then, more perfect union. I took Whitehead's class, and he goes, what does that mean? You know what that means? Abraham Lincoln used that in his inaugural address. More perfect union. He says, we start with the Articles of Association. We go to the Declaration of Independence. That's more perfect. We go to the, the Articles of Confederation. That's more perfect. We go to the Constitution. That's more perfect. And, oh, where are we going to go? International law. That's more perfect. So once you shake your hand, you can never... And you know what he negated? Declaration of Independence. See, And so if you thought it through, you'd say, wait a minute, more perfect union is dialectic. Because you don't have the right to say, I secede because this is right and you're wrong. See, people who have signed the covenant with a purpose-driven church, that's a covenant. That's a political covenant. They don't realize the lethalness of what they have done. Because it will go on. As Bill Clinton, remember he took the Palestinian and Israeli leader, they couldn't get them together and he was out there on the steps and he grabbed their hands and shook their hands as far as they're concerned. The moment anything, you write it on a little scratch of paper, mediation, any form of mediation, that, that supersedes any position you have in disagreement. So that's why the mission statements. Uh, our friends that have learned that you better write that mission statement before the, the liberals, you know, the feds get in there because that goes to court. They'll recognize the, the mission. It's just a nebulous document. But it's written nebulously so that these guys can freely roam in setting policy. And the ranchers have to go through these laws that say, you know, they'll use the word premise instead of property. Well, you sign that contract, premise you don't own. Premise is just a, an area where you might be renting property, but it's a premise. Somebody lives in that premise. And so the moment you sign that document, you lost your property. Go to court. Try to get it back. See, it's all trickery. It's lies. It's deceitfulness. And these guys live for it because they've been deceived and they take what? Pleasure in deceiving others because that's where the dopamine lies. There's no dopamine in repentance. There's no dopamine in chastening. It comes afterwards. You know, that's when the child, you know, a lot of times they, want, they say, well, we want the children's heart of hearts. Do you really? I mean, they come up and they hug your neck and that feels good, you get dopamine. But they're wanting something. And it's not that you don't want to give your children something, but there's, there's sometimes it's just, a, you, you, you resent that. It's, no, this is not right. But when a child is chastened, and, and correctly so, you know, it's correct what's going on. And they come out and they give you a hug. Wow. That's real. There, there's no, no price you can put on that. And see, that's what God wants in our life. He wants children to come before Him just because we love Him. Not saying, give me, give me, give me, give me. But look at the church today. Prosperity this, prosperity this, prosperity this. And I have not, I, a minister's going to have a billion dollars. I have no problem with that. See, it's not that God doesn't want to bless us. It's that that blessing cannot come first. I see too many white knuckle Christians. They're just, you know, God's trying to remove it because they're worshiping it and they're just hanging on, you know. God said, let it go. Give it to me. 
So uh, just be wise in, in the decisions. Let the Lord lead in the, in the wisdom there. Yes? Is there any book that you would suggest that would cover the history of the Bible translations? Yeah, which version is the Bible by Lloyd Nolan Jones? It's on my uh, reference on my website, authorityresearch.com. I have a, a link in there that says, why do, why do I continue to use the King James Bible? And by the way, if you get on the Internet, um, you're going to find 99.999% of the articles that deal with the Texas Receptus mocking. I mean, you're, you're going to be a lone duck out there if you uh, go with the Texas Receptus. So if you go into the churches today and say, well, I'm Texas Receptus only, you know, the leadership is uh, going to correct you, you know, enlighten you. <laughs> Because you know, enlightenment simply means you don't depend on God anymore. That's what enlightenment was all about. And that was seminary. I mean, you study. They say, oh, we're going to study all these different philosophies and viewpoints so that you'll be able to handle them. No. You study the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is to direct us. Yes. And, and then, of course, as Americans, and we come from European stock, we're so um, Euro-centered. And have you done any... I know this would be a total another branch, but like Chinese philosophy and Indian philosophy. Mm -hmm. Eastern religion. Yeah. Yeah. Which is yin yang. It's a, it's the same. There's a little good and evil, a little evil in the good, and so we just have to keep change again. That's what's moving change. But a little bit that I've studied, like the Indian religions, especially, it's almost like they did go right into kind of like demon worship because their gods a lot of mm -hmm. seem more mm -hmm. akin to. Right. And that influenced uh, philosophy in Germany. Actually, there was a time when Germany, the language was very didactic. And then there were uh, Jesuit priests who came in and changed the language. They, they actually went in and uh, so that then the German language became full of the Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. And you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is becoming very popular today. A lot of people are turning to him. He was very confused. Uh, because people are frustrated with what they're seeing in the church and they're going looking for stability. And so Dietrich Bonhoeffer sounds very gospel. And all that stuff is good. But his doctoral dissertation gives it away because he, he, he Gesellschaft is simply used an individual in, a citizen in the, the neighborhood. Okay? So you are of infinite worth. So the police will serve and protect you as an individual. Gemeinschaft is you're a part of the community. You have no worth unless you're part of the community. So the police serve the community. And if you're not working for the community, then eh, they might not really be that quick to help you. His doctoral dissertation was the Gemeinschaft of theology. Mm -hmm. See? And so when you go back to the German and you, you understand these words and you go, okay, it sounds good. You ever been there? It sounds good, but there's something wrong here. And so, uh, again, he's written some good stuff. And these guys do. You can pick up some of these books and they're, they're, there's some deadly stuff in there, but there's a lot of good stuff. And I just say, if, you, if that's where you are, just go to the Word of God and eventually you're, there's going to be a conflict. Go with the Word of God and you might learn something from this guy, but eventually you're going to be moving away and growing in, in the Word. And you're going to be... All my friends, I kiddingly say this, but it's very true, unfortunately. All my friends have no friends. You just very you learn it's just very painful because it just seems like the the more you confront what's going on in the world, uh, and that's not that you go out and and, and you know, get in people's face, but you just start sharing the truth, and all of a sudden you just find people are distancing themselves from you. Don't don't talk to Joe, you know. Don't talk to Dean at the family reunion because you get him started, we got a problem. So. And we struggle with this. I struggle with it. Because, you know, I, I, I like people and you don't want to be an offense. And so you find yourself caught between, do I hold a position? Yeah, I have to. I have to. We have to. God gives us a position. Hold to it. It's eternal. This stuff isn't. It's going. What is it? What profiteth a man to get all the dopamine of the world? Lose your soul. Oh. Well, we've uh, you're very enduring. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. thank you. God bless you.